Hello, everybody, and welcome into TD Ameritrade Park in Omaha, Nebraska, for WCBN Sports coverage of the 2019 College World Series Finals in Michigan Baseball. Today's game one of the best of three series is between the visiting Michigan Wolverines and the home team, the Vanderbilt Commodores. I'm Austin Bucko. Alongside me is Daniel Thompson bringing you the action all series long here as Michigan goes for their first national championship since 1962. And despite what is the highest of possible stakes you can have here, Michigan baseball team playing with a looseness, or as Joe Donovan calls it, a goofness thus far on the biggest possible stage. Yep, I'm not sure if that's the word, but he coined it on Sunday. Uh, the press conference where him and Jimmy Kerr, along with Coach Backage, spoke to the me national media. And uh, it really, it's not much to say here that this is the highest stakes Michigan is going to be playing on all year. I think most of the players, Jimmy Kerr has admitted himself, his goal entering Michigan as a freshman was to win a Big Ten championship. Getting to Omaha was something he only came to aspire once having a couple years in this program and really seeing what coach Eric Backage was, was building and then simply making it to this national championship series I think that has blown everyone's wildest dreams out of the water I think you and I four weeks ago I believe it was a month and one day in the past where uh, Jordan Wogu hit that walk-off game winner versus Illinois both, both of us were really thinking, you know, if they can make it to Omaha, that'd be wonderful. But to be here, they've stayed loose, and that's what Coach Bakich has been talking about. They were a pitch, a pitch away from ending their season. Now they're alive, they know they're playing with house money right now. They are playing loose, they're playing free, and they are ready for this moment. And speaking of Jordan Wogu, he's going to be the leadoff hitter for Michigan and the ball game here. He'll be followed by Jesse Franklin and Jordan Brewer. Wogu the DH, Jesse Franklin, center field, Jordan Brewer, right field. Finishing out the middle of Michigan order is Jimmy Kerr at first base in the cleanup spot. Blake Nelson plays third, bats fifth. Batting sixth, left fielder Christian Bullock. Jack Blimer in the shortstop, bats seventh. Batting eighth is the catcher, Joe Donovan. And rounding out the lineup is Akeo Thomas, the nine hitter at second base. They'll go against Drake Fellows, who winds and delivers a first pitch low, ball one, to Jordan Wogu to start off the College World Series Finals. And there you have it. Uh, fav I guess that favors Michigan, the very first pitch of this College World Series. Not sure how much of an impact that will have, but Michigan off to the right start. A long wind up again, another pitch that's fired low. It bounces in front of the plate, and it's 2-0 on the Wolverine leadoff hitter here in the first. And Fellows is 13-1 on the season, entered the postseason as the nation's wins leader and undefeated at 12-0. <clears throat> Did have one hiccup, which we may touch on in a bit here. Another wind up 2-0 pitch to Wogu. Misses low and away, ball three. The so Michigan fans yeah. are out here today. You can probably hear a few claps here. Wogu starts out 3-0. An uncharacteristically bad start for a guy who has an MLB caliber talent. He was the 173rd overall pick in the sixth round to the Padres just a few weeks ago. Fellows comes set, looks in for a sign, and winds up for another pitch. It's 3-0 and catches the outside part of the plate. Shti, right one. Yet Wogu never looked interested in swinging at that one. He was daring Fellows to throw his first strike of the game. Wogu's well, been hopping out a lot of first pitches recently. Hasn't gotten the chance to do so here, but he's up 3-1 and the pitch. This is high and in ball four. Almost hits him in the head as Wogu spins out of the way. But Michigan has the leadoff runner on here in game one of the College World Series Finals. And a lack of control there from Fellows. Only that one strike was the, the only one that was close to being one. Three real low and then one high and tight for Jordan Wogu. We'll have to see if Fellows can settle in here, but I think that right there is what we were talking about pregame. Michigan, they're kind of playing with house money. Vandy, they're the second overall seed in the country, preseason number one. They definitely, I think, feel more pressure on them going into this game. Fellows, the tall 6'5 right-hander out of Plainfield, Illinois, comes set at the belt to, for the first pitch to Jesse Franklin. It's a fastball. Franklin hits it up the middle for a base hit into center field. Wogu's going to round second and head towards third. The throw is going to be in time at third base. Wogu is thrown out trying to stretch it as Franklin gets into second base. That throw out there by the center fielder, that's Pat DeMarco, who made a strike one hop over to third base. Austin Martin slapped the tag down. There's one out, runner on second here in the first. And you really can't be mad at that if you're a Michigan fan. That's how Michigan got here. Aggressive base running was the name of the game. That's what they've been doing all season long. They risked it, and because of that throw, Jesse Franklin was able to advance to second. So it's go he's... In the end, Michigan still has a runner in scoring position, but that's how they got here. They're going to live and die with that base running, and so far it's been more or less beneficial to them. Uh, i got to disagree with you there, Daniel, on that one. I, I feel like starting off your top of the first, got a runner on. you got a hard single. 
The ball was already at the center fielder out there, DeMarco, by the time Wilku was rounding second. Seemed like a poor decision to go, but either way, Jordan Brewer is up with the runner in scoring position, as you mentioned. The first pitch misses high to him, ball one with the fastball. I mean, I agree tactically it's a bad decision, but that's the way Backage has coached these guys, and if they're going to stay loose, going to keep playing the way I think they have all year, I think that's ultimately one a pill you're going to have to swallow, that those mistakes are going to happen, but I think similar decisions will pay off later in this game. Fellows checks the runner at second, 1-0 pitch to Brewer. It's a breaking ball, misses down and away, ball two. Brewer had trouble recognizing breaking balls against Texas Tech. Looked like he... Thought about swinging there. The hand started to come through the zone, but he laid off. Did the Big Ten Player of the Year, coming in batting 329 on the season. 12 home runs. Ties him for third on the team with the man who just got thrown out, Jordan Wogu. Did not have a good game at all on Friday. Only advanced to first base through a hit through a hit by pitch. Coming set is Fellows, and he fires another one to Brewer. Down and in. Ball three. So the Second time in three batters in this ballgame that fellow has fallen behind 3-0. Yeah, a really rocky start here for Drake Fellows, who has been a phenomenal pitcher all season round. Had that one hiccup versus Duke in the first Super Regional game. And you have to wonder if maybe the moment is getting to him right now. A very atypical start for Fellows. Brewer waits a 3-0 pitch and takes it for strike one. It's a fastball. Count is 3-1 and one on Brewer. Yeah, you mentioned Drake Fellows. Been good all year. His numbers on the year. His 19th start, 19th appearance overall. He's gone two complete games this year while amassing a 3.97 ERA, 13-1 record. Pitched 111 innings, struck out 126, walked 43. Batters hit 245 against the big right-hander. 3-1 pitch to Brewer. This is a line shot down the right field line. Will it get fair? It is a fair ball into the corner. Jesse Franklin's going to score. Brewer's booking it towards second. He's going to try for third. The relay throw coming in. Jordan Brewer slips on the way towards third base, and he's going to run back towards second. I think he would have been safe at third. But I really do. Either way, Michigan leads 1-0 here in game one. And that's just remarkable. Michigan now is 4-4, four for four, getting a first inning run in all four of their college World Series games so far. There will be a fifth. We'll see if they can go for that now. Jordan Brewer heading back to first just to exchange some equipment, get rid of the pads and the stirrups, but you really do think he could have gotten a third there. Yeah, he was, by the time he slipped, the relay throw was just getting to the second baseman, Ray. No, he never considered even stopping at second, I don't no, think. No, he, he was halfway to third by the time the relay throw. There was no chance that relay throw from Ray was going to get there. As good as Ray is on the infield, has a good arm for a second baseman. Uh, he had no shot at Brewer the way he was booking it around. So some base running hiccups in Michigan could up be up 2 nothing right now with a runner on third. You can't really afford these mistakes in, against a team like Vandy, but. Yeah, let's see, that comes back to that that mistake there. Like I said, you, you did say aggressive base running is good. I, I just thought that was just a, not a good move by Wogu. As you said, it could be 2 nothing right now. As it stands, it is 1 nothing. Jordan Brewers on second base. Jimmy Kerr, the Michigan RBI leader, up to bat, though. Righty to lefty here. First pitch to the at bat. Off speed catches the outside part of the plate, strike one. Yep, and Jimmy Kerr also leads the whole College World Series field here in Omaha with six RBIs in this College World Series. Actually, it's Ty. Uh, yes, the, the, in, in fact, the leader, Jesse Franklin, in second at five. A chance to build on that lead right here. The exaggerated set there from Fellows before firing another off-speed pitch. This one misses low and away. Ball one. It's one and one on Jimmy Kerr. And yeah, as you mentioned, Jimmy Kerr has been absolutely fantastic, not just in this College World Series, but... In the NCAA tournament altogether, the Corvallis Regional most valuable player slumped a little bit at UCLA, as long as you can really call that a slump. He was still contributing positively to the lineup. He swings and misses late here on a fastball, and it's one and two. And he all, he's just phenomenal all around. He is tied for the hits lead at six, along with Drew Campbell of Louisville, and you'd expect he'd to capture that lead in this series, and also is in first place for runs scored, five ahead of teammate Jimmy Kerr, four. Also in the lead with home runs, tied with a bunch of guys at two. Yeah, Kerr hit two last game in that 15-3 to thwomping of Texas Tech. A 2-1, or rather 1-2 pitch to him, bounces low on the breaking ball, and it's 2-2. Two and two. And here's where the other area just kind of comes in. You know, you think Jimmy Kerr will see what he has to do here, but he could be in a position where just a fly ball might be enough to make this a two-run ball game as Jordan Brewer trips on the way to third. But you'll, you're going to take it right now if you're Michigan. Could be in a could be looking at a 3-0 lead, though, with one good swing of the bat right now. Had 
Jordan Brewer been, or Rogu been more cautious. Fellows throws a breaking ball, swing and missed by Jimmy Kern, a ball that bounced in the dirt. Got him chasing there, did Fellows for his first strike out of the day, and there's now two outs running around second for Blake Nelson. Yeah, Michigan also it has the highest batting average here in Omaha, uh, thanks in no small part to that 276 batting average, largely thanks to the uh, Texas Tech game where they won 15-3. to They certainly, you can say, are the hotter team coming in as Vanderbilt needed a big top of the ninth to go ahead and win against Louisville on Friday night. Blake Nelson, a senior following up the senior curve, batting an even 300 on the season. Had a couple hits against Texas Tech as he did the first time we just hit him. This one is a single in the left field. Brewer is going to come around third. He will score. The throw coming home is cut off, so Nelson stays at first. But a 2 nothing lead as Blake Nelson slaps his chest, the Michigan logo across it, and they're up 2 nothing here in the top of the first. And there you have it. What a way for these Wolverines. They always are getting off to a hot start. Up 2 nothing now. That's the second consecutive game where they score two runs in the first. They go 1-1, one, 2-2 one, two, two in their first innings here in Omaha. I'm excited to see what they have tomorrow. I, they could be up 3 nothing right now, in all honesty. I, I mean, certainly it's looked, it's with the wrong decision in hindsight, and I think instant by instant that was tactically an error by Jordan Wogu. But that, that, that philosophy is what's gotten Michigan here. Yeah, for Michigan, they're hoping that doesn't come back to bite them later, but they will definitely take a 2 nothing lead in the first inning. You don't want to get too greedy there, wishing it was 3 nothing. And they've already got fellows up at 17 pitches here before he's even recorded the third out in the first. A pickoff throw chases. Blake Nelson back, and Christian Bullock's going to step up to the plate. Left-handed hitting left fielder from Michigan. Fellows comes set and puts his arms up and comes back at the belt. Another pick off throw, Nelson's back in diving. It'll be huge for Fellows to try to get ahead of this at bat. Did get Jimmy Kerr swinging because he got ahead in that one, and Christian Bullock has had the worst outing so far in Omaha of the Michigan lineup. Old started over seven, then walked three times and got a hit in the Texas Tech game, but outside of that, it's been a whole lot of nothing for him. He'll want to get ahead in this one. First pitch to him, swing and a miss at a high fastball. Counts 0 1 on Bullock. And that's what Fellows needs. Bullock really has only thrived when he's ahead in this account, these counts here in Omaha. That's the start he needs, but the damage is already done. Two runs, runner on first. We'll see if Michigan, Michigan can extend the inning and Fellows woes. Fellows comes set. Nelson getting aggressive with the lead over there at first base. He is not going here as Bullock swings and misses that other fastball. This one a little bit farther down, maybe a little bit in as well. And the count's now 0-2 on Bullock. Bullock a 280 hitter on the season. Gets on base at an even 400 clip. Has himself 10 extra base hits on the season. Six doubles, two triples, two home runs, and limited playing time compared to most of these Wolverines. About half as many of at-bats, if not even less than that. And no two pitch to him. It's fouled up towards the left side. There is going to be a play here for the catcher, Clark. He drops the mask, ranges over near the third base coach's box, and makes the grab and foul ground for out number three. Good play by him there because his face was just entering the sunlight. The shade from the upper roof here and the press box no longer aiding him right when that ball was coming down to his glove, but ignores the distractions. That's what these moments are all about here with the national championship on the line. Mental focus. He had it ends the inning, but not before Michigan puts up two. The best leadoff team in the College World Series. Yeah, Michigan puts up two here in the top of the first, take a 2 nothing lead in game one of the College World Series finals. We'll head to the bottom of the first to score Michigan 2, Vanderbilt coming up. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast from Michigan Baseball here on WCBN Sports. And for Vanderbilt, certainly capable of putting up runs themselves. Their runs tend to come a little bit later in the game. They like to wear teams out. But it is a strong lineup right from the get-go. They'll start off with the leadoff hitter, Austin Martin. He plays third base. J.J. Blade, the right fielder, bats second. Batting third, shortstop Ethan Paul. Philip Clark is the catcher. He bats fourth. Batting fifth, the center fielder, Pat DeMarco. Steven Scott is the left fielder. He bats sixth. Batting seventh, playing second base, Harrison Ray. In the eighth spot is Ty Duvall. He's the designated hitter for the Commodores. And rounding out the lineup, the first baseman, Julian Infante. They will go against the left-hander from Portage, Michigan, for the Wolverines, Tommy Henry. The junior has appeared 19 times this season, 18 starts. He's 11-5 with a 3.27 ERA, including two complete games, just like his counterpart, Drake Fellows. Pitched 115 and two-thirds innings. Struck out 127 batters. 
walked just 25, and batters hit him easily 221 against the left-hander. And fair to say, Tommy Henry coming off the best start of his entire Michigan career, possibly the second to last start, or most likely guaranteed to be the second to last start of his Michigan career. Absolutely is, but I mean, what a run he's had in this postseason. He had his flu game moment against UCLA in Game Three of the Los Angeles Super Regional, and then followed it up with perhaps a more outstanding performance in a 2 nothing win against Florida State. All around, just dominant performance. Only surrendered three hits in the whole game. Drake Fellows has already given up three right here. And we'll see what he has against the, st the stiffest competition he's faced all year, Austin Martin. Going to be a highly drafted player next year. First pitch is a weak ground ball to third base. Blake Nelson's going to field. He throws accurately in time to first base. One pitch, one out. As you mentioned there, Austin Martin. Didn't even get a chance to talk about it. I guess we'll wait till his second yeah. at-bat to get there as he grounds out quickly here on the first pitch. That's okay. I think he gets talked about a fair amount. <laughs> I'm sure he's getting tons of buzz throughout this College World Series. I know even just watching the games, we've talked about him a bunch. Yep, and uh, on the first pitch, I believe, or first at-bat for sure, I know, of the third game here at the College World Series, he went yard against Louisville to go up one nothing. So he's a very dangerous leadoff hitter. Michigan retires him immediately on the first pitch. If Tommy Henry's going to go a full nine innings today, which is very unlikely. He's off to the right start. First pitch to J.J. Blade is on the outside corner for a strike, 0-1. Lefty-lefty matchup here against the number four overall yep. pick this past season to Miami. Yeah, talk about guys who might go high in the MLB draft. This guy did. Fourth overall, Josh Young was an eighth overall pick. Michigan faced him twice already. Here you go, number four in the MLB draft. Another lefty-lefty, 0-1 pitch. This one's at the knee, strike two. Yep, Tommy Henry pounding the strike zone early, 90 miles an hour, says the gun here at TD Ameritrade Park. We do believe it is a couple ticks low here as the gauntlet scoreboard. Yep, the future Miami Marlin, though, he's down 0-2 in this count. Henry looks in for the sign, comes set, the wind-up, 0-2. This one's a tweak tapper over towards first base. Jimmy Kerfield's a step away from the bag and steps on the bag himself, three unassisted for the second out of the inning. And if you're a Michigan fan, it's tempting to think, could this game have started any better? Well, yes, it could if Jordan Moku could have not gotten <laughs> caught going to third, but... I mean, right now, that is a marvelous result as uh, Jesse Franklin also now has tied Jimmy Kerr for fifth, for first place with five uh, <laughs> runs for the two of them. You are keeping an eye on the leaderboards here. Daniel Thompson in charge of keeping the leaderboards. Well, and we, we, we heard on uh, Friday night that Jesse Franklin's a little bit interested in catching up to Jimmy Kerr in these stats. Uh, at least in the season-long home run yes. totals. Ethan Paul steps up, takes a first pitch strike on the outside part of the plate from Henry. It's 0-1. Another lefty-lefty matchup here. There's three straight lefties after the right-hander Austin Martin leads things off. And another future major leaguer. He went in the ninth round to the Pirates. Tons of talent in this Vanderbilt lineup and on this Vanderbilt team. As Henry takes a breath, winds up in the 0-1 pitch. Foul back to the screen. First time someone's made... Not a weak little dribbler's worth yeah. of contact off of Henry in the first three batters, but he's still up in the count 0-2. And still looking for his first ball. Well, he's not looking for it, but Vanderbilt is begging <laughs> for it. As the shortstop was selected, 274th overall, Ethan Paul. Bats left, throws right, as most left-handed hitting infielders do. Henry takes a breath, 0-2 pitch. Fastball swing and a miss, strike three. Henry retires the side, no order, tops it off with a strikeout. Takes just seven pitches to set down the top of the Vanderbilt order. We head to the second inning, and as you said, this could not go much better for Michigan. They lead 2-0 over Vanderbilt in game one of the College World Series finals. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast of Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. Austin Bucko alongside Daniel Thompson bringing you the action for this entire series as we have all College World Series long and Big Ten tournament. While we're at it, we are here in Omaha for that as well. We bring you coverage of Michigan baseball all season long right here on YouTube.com backslash WCBN Sports. And yeah, I don't even want you to have to guess how many how many uh, Michigan games you've called this season or over the past three it, years. It, it's a lot. We'll just say yeah, that. <laughs> even followed this team down to Nashville a year ago. Not to face Vanderbilt, though, facing Lipscomb. Uh, that did not go Michigan's way. It did not. Michigan last year... A little bit of a rebuilding year. We saw a lot of influx of talent. Number 10 ranked recruiting class in the country last year. The highest ever the Big Ten is any Big Ten team has brought in since they kept recruiting rankings. And the talent really starting to come to fruition here. You see it throughout the Michigan lineup. Jordan Wogu, Jesse Franklin, Jack Blomgren, Joe Donovan, just to name the sophomores that were in here. Not to mention transfers like Blake Nelson. 
Uh, Jordan Brewer came a year after those guys, but he's a transfer in here as well. The influx of talent that head coach Eric Backage has brought in over the last couple of years is the reason that Michigan is here in the finals of the College World Series and up to nothing in the first inning yep. of the College World Series. Talk about talent. There's five drafted guys here on this Vanderbilt team. The Michigan matches that five guys getting selected as well. Now, Jimmy Kerr and Jack Weisenberger not being selected as high as a couple of these Vandy, Vandy boys, but you saw three different Michigan players selected before the second Commodore selected in the MLB draft just a few weeks ago. So talent for, I mean, Vandy, yeah, they're a bit more talented when you're on top of the college baseball world for a few years here, winning that championship in 2014 and winning their third not long ago. They're going to be able to out-recruit any Big Ten school, but Michigan, uh, UCLA and Vanderbilt, and probably Texas Tech, too, are the only teams they've faced so far that I think are just honestly more talented than them. Otherwise, they've been having more talent and just playing more cohesively as a team than everyone they've faced, and that's gotten them here to this point where they are leading in the early moments of the College World Series championship series. Jack Blomer is going to lead things off here on the top of the second. His first pitch is fouled down the right field line, just past us, oh, and bouncing oh. into the club seats. It's 0-1 on him. Yep, that was one of our best chances to take home a souvenir <laughs> yet. Uh, that one might have hit the underside of the surface we're up on right now. If you haven't tuned into us this week, we're on the roof over here by the first base side at TD Ameritrade Park. Had the option to go inside today, but you know we're not going to switch up that mojo with the announcers, Jinx and all. We're, we're going to try to use our powers for good as the 0-1 pitch to Blomgren misses low and away. It's 1-1. and -1. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. We're not going to mess with anything in terms of mojo. You know, baseball, very superstitious sport. I'm pretty superstitious when it comes to it. 1-1 pitch to Blomgren off speed, taken for a strike, 1-2. and -2. And that's what Fellows is going to need. All, these, all those hits that he gave up in the first inning came with being de behind in the count, he's going to have to stay ahead of these, you know, be able to throw the pitches he wants, as he's already off to, well, his worst game since the Duke one. He looks in for the sign with a glove near his right shoulder, then winds up and fires a breaking ball, misses low and away. It's now 2-2 two and two on Blomgren. We've referenced that Duke game a couple times now. If you didn't catch that score, it was 18-5, to five, I believe, final, where Duke just smashed Vanderbilt at, in Nashville to go ahead in that series. Vandy came roaring back and only surrendered two runs for the rest of the series, winning that one 2-1. Two, 2-2 one. Two, two pitch on the way to Blomgren. This one is poked down the right field line. That one's going to hook foul, though. And the count's going to remain 2-2. Two and two. And that one had a chance to take a real funny bounce into the outfield. Uh, we saw Michigan surrender one in that three-run second inning for the Red Raiders back on Friday. A very similar, nearly checked swing hit. Blomgren not quite having the right angle there, but he was close, staying alive in this one and extending that pitch count up to 25, only through one. Fellows winds up. 2-2 pitch to Blomgren. This one's a check swing that Blomgren barely gets a piece of and taps behind the plate. Counts going to remain 2-2. Two two. Blomgren knew that one was the ball at the last second, but his bat was already going through the zone. He was able to get a, enough of it to stay alive. And that's part of this. Uh, already up to 26, in, 26 pitches is Fellows. Very unlikely he goes to complete game, and if Michigan can take him out early, that is only to their advantage. Blomgren, the shortstop, hitting 303 as the sophomore takes a breaking ball on 2-2 outside and low. It's 3-2. And, and not only has he extended that pitch count now, he has gotten himself into a full count. So one favorable pitch, and he will be on base, marking a second consecutive inning for the Wolverines to get the leadoff batter on. Blomgren takes a 3-2 pitch. Low and away, ball four. So, yeah, as you mentioned, the second straight inning, Michigan has led off the inning with a leadoff walk. We'll have a runner on first. Nobody out for the catcher, Joe Donovan. And there you have it. He only had one walk in the previous outing versus Louisville to start this College World Series way back on Monday. But, or, no, that was a Sunday, eight days ago now. Uh, one walk, seven hits surrendered, but only one run. That one was earned in a seven inning, a six strikeout, seven inning outing. So already off to a worse start than he did in the full seven innings versus Louisville. Louisville only putting up three runs in total in their two games against Vandy. First pitch, Jack Blomgren fakes running, check swing at the plate by Donovan, does not go around, but the high fastball gets passed back to the screen, and now Blomgren's going to move up to second base. And there you go. Vandy had not made a mistake yet this game. They just didn't play as well as Michigan to start off in that first inning, but Michigan really had two base running issues in the top of the first. Get one back right there as there's now a runner in scoring position with none out, and uh, Joe Donovan not hitting spectacularly in the postseason. I think he's very liable now to... Bump, lay one down for a bunt or maybe try to drive one into the outfield. He is a power hitter. Eight home runs on the year. You hear a little bit of eruption of the crowd here. 
As we get a visit to the mound here for Vanderbilt. Can't see who that is walking out to the mound right now. I don't know if Tim Corbin walked out there and maybe settled his team down or one of his assistant coaches. Blomgren's going to jog back to the Michigan dugout and get a word in as well. Michigan's in those 1962 throwback uniforms today. The off-white tops and bottoms, blue Michigan across the chest, the blue numbers underneath it, blue numbers on the back, yellow trimming for all of that. And, of course, the stirrups, white socks, blue stirrups with the maize stripes going horizontally around the calf. Vanderbilt's in their greens today, their military greens with the American flag on it. Vanderbilt across the front. Black numbers with the gold trim on the back. Vanderbilt's got the green hats, the black brims. Michigan, of course, with their blue hats and the maze block M on them. Yep, they're definitely going with a salute to service theme here in Omaha. We saw yesterday at the practice field, they uh, rather than names on the back of the jerseys, they had everyone's home state. Uh, we did see Fellows 66 warming up at first base uh, for the warm-ups uh, on Sunday, number 66, Ill Brewing, Illinois, on the back. It is Military Appreciation Day here at TD Ameritrade Park as we had a flyover to start from one of the stealth bombers at the airbase not too far south of here. Coming set now is Fellows. Jordan squares around a bunt but pulls back as that breaking ball bounces off the plate. And it's 2-0 and on the Wolverine catcher. Yeah, right now Michigan is kind of signaling the Vandy. They're happy to give him an out. And right now they might just put the runner on regardless. 2-0 count for Donovan. That was kind of a weird bunt attempt by Donovan, too. Almost either half-hearted or looked like he was going to try to punch it maybe over the first baseman charging over there over Julian Infante's head if he can. Donovan's beat out a sacrifice bunt to first base earlier this year. As a 2-0 pitch, he squares on a bunt and pulls back and misses low and away. Ball three. Yeah, Infante is playing real shallow right now. Almost in almost in line with Bellows right here from our view. Five or six. At, he was for a moment, like ten steps in front of the first base bag. But at the 3-0 count for Donovan now, he might just be happy to take a walk to first here if he can get it. Bellows looks in for the sign, comes set. And a 3-0 pitch. Fastball called, strike one. And not a very appetizing bunt right there for Donovan as Infante was maybe 15 steps in front of the bag. Almost parallel with the mound here from Joe Donovan's perspective. And we'll see Donovan was not squaring on the 3-0. We'll see if he squares on the 3-1. The defensive lineman for Vanderbilt real quick across the outfield left to right. Steven Scott, Pat DeMarco, and J.J. Blade as a 3-1 pitch to Donovan as a fastball at the belt. Strike two. So Bellows fights his way up into a full count, and now it'll be a bit more interesting to see what Donovan brings here. And Fonte takes several steps back and is now playing behind the bag and a few paces to the left. Vanderbilt's left side of the infield is Austin Martin at third, Ethan Paul at short. Right side is Harrison Ray and Julian Infante, as we've been talking about that first baseman. Coming set now is Fellows ready for a 3-2 to Donovan. Here it comes. This one is fouled off right to Nick Schnabel, who makes the play over there in the third base coach's box. And then rolls it into the Vanderbilt dugout. Great catch, yeah, three and two. great catch showing some great reflexes right there by the third base coach. That one was coming right at him, but makes the heads up play and keeps himself in this game. Th pitch number 35 coming for Drake Fellows. I mean, Nick Schnabel coaches the infield for Michigan. He's really showing off the soft hands there, let it come into his bread basket before tossing it over. Another 3-2 to Joe Donovan, really high and inside. Joe Donovan's going to walk ball four. Two straight walks to start off the second here. That's three on the day already for Fellows. And Michigan is in business in the second. Yep, Joe Donovan had to duck to avoid that one. And he, you know, he, with a full count, that's an easy decision. Get out of the way. That one is for sure a ball. You're taking first base. He's only advanced to first once this College World Series via a hit. Has been walked several times now. So you cannot put Michigan on the bait, especially in the back end of the lineup for Michigan. You really can't afford to put them on the bases through walks as the K.O. Thomas steps up to the bat. Not really a power hitter. I wonder if a bunt is in play or if Michigan's going to try to really rip this one open. K.O. Thomas had clutch hits all season and all postseason long for Michigan. He squares around here on the first pitch, takes a fastball called strike one. Yet the last two times Michigan was trailing, it was Thomas who either tied things up or put Michigan in the lead with two big RBIs. First coming in the Los Angeles Super Regional and then on Friday against Texas Tech, Michigan was down, if you can believe it. Uh, after ultimately winning by 12, trailed in the bottom of the second inning before Akeo Thomas tied things back up. And Michigan took the lead in the bottom of that second, never looked back. As Fellow comes set, we'll see if Akeo Thomas is squaring again. He is, but he fouls the bunt behind him, and it's 0-2. 
And Infante once again playing way in front of the bag with two strikes now. I think he's going to retreat to the position he did when Joe Donovan was walked. But that'll be something for Michigan to think about going forward. As Infante actually is going to stay in front of the bag right now. Nutman walking back now, taking his time to find where he's going to hang out here for the next couple pitches. And now expecting Akira Thomas to still be bunting here on 0-2. If Thomas can get one down the right field line, he's got himself a hit. We'll see if he is squaring here on 0-2. He is not, as he is poked on the left field line. Will it stay fair? It is a fair ball! Coming around to score is Blomgren. Joe Donovan booking it towards third. He'll be held. Akeo Thomas is in the second with an RBI double. And Michigan leads three to nothing here in the second. And I'm just in disbelief right now as Vanderbilt hitting is their strength. I mean, they have phenomenal pitching. Kumar Rocker has drawn the country. Uh, he's gotten all the national attention recently. But Drake Bellows is their Friday starter. And he is unraveling right now. Yet to record an out here in the first inning. Uh, we saw Texas Tech pull their pull their starter, Micah Dallas, on Friday before recording an out in the second. I don't think that's going to happen here for Drake Fellows. But you now have one of the best power hitters here left in Omaha. I mean, there's only two teams left. But Jordan Wogu is liable to knock one to the outfield whenever he pleases. That could easily tag up Joe Donovan. But Michigan right now, I think they got to try to step on their throats while they've got him down. Up 3 nothing. This could get to a big lead early here. Everything's working for the Wolverines. Akira Thomas just poking that one off the end of the bat. It's the first pitch of Jordan Wogu swung on and missed strike one on the fastball. Definitely try to get a piece of one there. He entered this College World Series tied for the home run lead on this Wolverine team. Now in third place thanks to home runs from Jimmy Kerr and Jesse Franklin. But looked like he was ready to get moved back up that list right there. Runners on second and third, nobody out in the second. Michigan leads Vanderbilt 3 nothing. Top of the order for Michigan, Jordan Wogu, 0-1 pitch to him. Misses low and away, ball one, and that first pitch swing in there from Wogu in the second time at the plate was the first time he swung at a pitch today. He walked on five pitches back in the first inning, and he's evened up 1-1 here. It's going to be crucial for Fellows to stay ahead of these at-bats right now. Tied. This is going to be a pivotal pitch. This is a ground ball towards third. Making the play over there is Austin Martin on a slide. Looks the runner back. Throws to first in time. Nice play by the future top ten pick. And there's one out in the second. And there's Michigan's first really anything to go wrong in this inning. And they avoided potentially a double play right there as that one was hit right to third. Heads up base running from Joe Donovan. Staying close to the bag and not getting caught in a double play there with, with none out and runners on second to third. Don't want to get too aggressive. As Jordan Wogu, strangely, has one of the worst starts for the Michigan batters here in Omaha. Just about everyone's gotten on. And he's one of the ones who hasn't got to score yet. Uh, Jesse Franklin now up to bat. He singled through the middle on the first pitch of his first at-bat last inning. This time they're playing a little bit of a shift on him. Second baseman Harrison Ray out into right field. The shortstop Ethan Paul right behind second base as Franklin checks swings and fouls it near the Vanderbilt dugout. Oh, wants the count on the Wolverine center fielder. And with one out now, the last chance to get a sacrifice fly. I think he might try to avoid the switch all together and uh, just knock one to the outfield here. Maybe let Joe Donovan tag up from third. Joe Donovan yet to attempt a stolen base on the year. Not the speediest guy, but Jesse Franklin can sure hit these deep. He's already got one home run here in Omaha. It was the second pitch of the game against Florida State. Gave Michigan a 1-0 lead. This time he takes a 0-1 pitch that bounces in the dirt. Now 1-1. Pitch count for Fellows up to 43 now here in just the second inning with one out. There is action in the Vanderbilt bullpen. Can't tell who's warming up out there, but he is warming up full go. Throwing to one of the catchers crouched behind the plate in the Vanderbilt bullpen. Yeah, we'll see if Fellows can settle into this one, but his day is going to be short in all likelihood. 1-1 one, one pitch to Franklin. High fastball check swing. He went around. It's 1-2. and two. Yeah, that's one he's going to wish he had back. That one was clearly going to be high for a while there. And uh, almost half-heartedly goes across the base right there. Jeff Henricks, home plate umpire, didn't need help on that one. He knew that Franklin went around. The rest of the umpires today, Perry Costello's at first, Scott Klein at second, and Greg Charles over there at third, who would have been the man appealed down to had Henricks thought he needed any help. Franklin's down in the count, one, two now. The pitch to him is a high, you know, way fastball. Evens the count of at two balls, two strikes. And not much higher than the previous pitch, but Jesse Franklin recognizing that pitch there and wisely doesn't swing, working his way back into this count, two, two. And trying to... 
maybe look for that slurvy breaking ball that Bellows has on that one where he went around on the high fastball. Recognized it early here and didn't chase. Bellows is going to step off before firing a 2-2 pitch. Perhaps just trying to make sure he's on the same page with his catcher back there, Philip Clark, with a runner on second. He comes set, takes a breath, 2-2 pitch to Franklin. This one is a bouncer towards the middle. Ranging over is the shortstop, Paul. He's going to have to throw to first base, though, and Donovan comes across to score. RBI ground out for Jesse Franklin. It's 4-0, Michigan in the second. And that will make him the co-RBI leader here in Omaha. He and Jimmy Kerr have just gone off. That is a deadly combo, batting second and fourth. We'll see if Jordan Brewer can get on here and give Jimmy Kerr a chance to, to bat this inning. But right now, Michigan, two, two run innings, maybe going to turn this one into a third as Jordan Brewer, one of the best batters on this team, of course, Big Ten Player of the Year, has not had a standout performance in Omaha, but he is always liable to drive in a man at third home. He drove in a runner in the first inning with an RBI doubled on the right field line. The infield shifting over to the left for him now. He swings and misses at a fastball. It's a one on him this time. The radar gun here showed 92. As we said, though, pretty sure it's a couple ticks slow. I wouldn't be surprised that one got up near 95, 96 if you're syncing us up with the broadcast at home. And you got to wonder how much longer fellows can keep throwing those, those fastballs, 95 or 96. A one pitch, breaking ball down and away. It's one and one. Already now, having thrown his 47th pitch, 48 upcoming, he's not going to be, go, be able to go much longer with his best stuff in this one. His ERA already up 26 points from the start of the game. Came in at 397. He's sitting at 423 right now. The third pitch of the at-bat to Brewer is a called strike. There's the fastball again, and it's 1-2 and two now on the Wolverine right fielder. Yep, Brewer, who helped, got the first run in, Jesse Franklin, with the double in the first, we'll see if he can get RBI number two on the day. Down in this count right now. Uh, plenty of room on the right side should he decide to go that way. Is the one-two pitch breaking ball down and away. It's two and two. And you got to figure here, fellows, wanted to put that one a little closer. Brewer had a lot of trouble laying off those breaking balls low against Texas Tech in that performance where we say he didn't really have his best game. It, it just flat out, he was the only batter in the starting lineup not to score a run in that one. Uh, wasn't really on base besides the hit-by-pitch. It's a 2-2 pitch, the line drive right at the shortstop. That's Ethan Paul making the grab at his shoe tops for out number three. But Michigan tacks on two more runs thanks to a Thomas RBI double and a Franklin RBI ground out. We'll head to the bottom of the second. The score, Michigan four. Vanderbilt nothing here in game one of the College World Series final. And Brewer still made that difficult for the Vanderbilt infielder. That one was, you know, just an inch away from taking his top, and that would, be, would have been a difficult throw, especially for a guy with the speed like Brewer. You're listening to WCBN Sports coverage of Michigan Baseball. We are the official student radio broadcast for Michigan Baseball here in Omaha and all season long at the Fish. Occasionally, as you mentioned, going on some road trips as well. We've certainly got to see a lot of Tommy here over the past few years. His final collegiate start coming up today. We started off beautifully. Seven pitches, one, two, three inning in the first, including a strikeout. So he'll face the four, five, and six hitters here in the second inning. Philip Clark, Pat DeMarco, and Steven Scott for the Vanderbilt Commodores. But no breaks in this Vanderbilt lineup after you face three 300 hitters to start off the game. Here in the second inning, you face two 300 hitters and a 294 hitter sandwiched between them. Yep, that's the reality of playing Vanderbilt. Michigan is going to need to keep scoring likely. Vanderbilt, uh, they haven't been putting up the huge numbers so far in Omaha offensively, but they tore through teams, uh, pitching staffs all on the way through the road to Omaha. Not quite like UCLA. You, Michigan's going to have to take down the top two seeds if they're going to win this national championship. Already took down number one, UCLA, in Los Angeles. Now number two, Vanderbilt. Got through the best bullpen and starting pitchers in the country. Michigan might have the best uh, Friday through Sunday starting lineup, but UCLA's bullpen really distinguishes them. And uh, Vanderbilt, the best offense in the country. Not too many people contesting that, although Texas Tech might give them a run for their money. And Michigan right now has gotten through all three of those hurdles we just mentioned. Well, first two, and then looking good right now against Vanderbilt. Yeah, as you mentioned, Texas Tech, a lineup very similar to Vanderbilt where you just don't get a rest all the way through. Top to bottom, they just hit, hit, hit. And uh, we mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Vanderbilt, a team that is going to wear you down. They'll, they'll get their runs 
later on in ball games a lot. Uh, they'll take a couple times through the order, but they'll really zone in on pitchers and zone in on teams and put up some crooked numbers later in the ball game. We've seen it a couple times here in the College World Series, albeit not huge numbers like Michigan's 15 spot against Texas Tech, but big numbers nonetheless. As Henry winds up, first pitches the looping liner into left field for a base hit. Blake Nelson looked like he had a shot at it. He kind of got his arms up. I don't think he saw it. He's playing right in the sun. The home plate is in the shade. It got past him over there. Michigan was shifted off towards the right side. So a leadoff single on the first pitch here from Philip Clark. And the second inning has Vanderbilt with their first runner of the ball game. Yep, and not Tommy Henry's best stuff. Hanging that one over the plate, giving an opportunity to get on base right there. And Vanderbilt takes it. But Michigan's dream start now, maybe starting to smell the roses and realize that they've got a full nine innings to win to stay ahead of the, in this one. It's not going to be smooth sailing the whole way. We'll see if Tommy Henry can get out of this one. First pitch here, follow up behind the plate. Joe Donovan ranges back, tries to make a grab while falling to his knees, does not make the grab. He crashes into the wall behind the home plate and might need a second. He's going to be helped up by the home plate umpire, Jeff Hendricks. The count is going to be 0-1 on Pat DeMarco after a bit of a scare there for Joe Donovan. Nice try, but couldn't come up with it. Yep, that would have been a great play had he gotten there. Really quick reactions to get to that one, and he actually overplayed it, that ball landing on his wrist. Ultimately, though, he was running straight headfirst into the wall. A lot of things to keep track of while chasing down that one and can't come away with, a, with what would have been a very big out, stealing Pat DeMarco from a real chance to try to help his teammate advance through these bases. DeMarco, the center fielder, has his arms very close together in a short stance. He lifts one off the end of the bat down the left field line. That's going to hook foul and get into the seats, and the count's going to be 0-2 on him. DeMarco, a 294 hitter on the year, 375 on base percentage, has some pop in the bat as well, 18 doubles, three triples, six home runs, and driven in 48 on the year. Yep, and if that one had been hit a little bit straighter, it would have at least drawn some oohs and ahs from the crowd as it would have had a chance to go the distance, 335 feet to the left field corner for a home run. That one ends up going about 300, though. Lefty righty, 0-2 pitch, misses high, ball one. The first ball Tommy Henry's thrown, it took till pitch number 11. And perhaps most surprisingly, the second inning, given those two stats, only 11 pitches in, one whole inning through until he concedes his first ball. Still up, though, 1-2 in the count. Runner at first base is Philip Clark. Not a huge threat to steal, just three stolen bases on the year, especially against lefty and a swing and a miss there against the fastball. Pat DeMarco goes down on strike. Second strike out of the day for Henry, and there's one out runner on first for Steven Scott. As he continues to build upon the record he now owns for single-season strikeouts, Fulton Wolverines uh, broke that in the game versus Florida State on Monday. And now has a huge lead. Uh, he's going to come up to, he's probably going to reach a double digit lead on the previous record holders by the time he's done. He's at 129 for the season now with two today. And now he'll face the left handed hitting left fielder Steven Scott, another guy with a lot of pop in his bat for Vanderbilt. 331 hitter, 14 home runs on the year, on 21 other extra base hits. Takes a first pitch fastball, rather slider on the outside corner, strike one on him. And yet another future MLB year. He was. The final pick of the 10th round going to the Red Sox with the 317th overall pick, and that, of course, is pretty important when it comes to contract negotiations for rookies. Yeah, after the 10th round, all the slots are the exact same for signing bonuses. 0-1 pitch to him. Fastball off the inside part of the plate, 1-1. Yep, so that'll probably be enough to make him go pro once his time is done here. He's a senior as well as Steven oh, Scott, okay. so... <laughs> Of course, no, I he doesn't really have him. a shot at coming back <laughs> next year. Well, maybe he'll pursue other interests. You never know. <laughs> Go pro on something other than sports. Yeah, As a 1-1 one, one pitch, breaking ball down low. Thought about swinging at Scott, but he held up. Nice stop by Donovan, and it's 2-1. As we do our job of appeasing the NCAA here uh, early in this one. And that's right, most of their athletes do go pro in something else, but hard to turn down an opportunity to play in the major leagues. We can hear the Vanderbilt whistler, Vandy whistler, not whistling, wooing right now. As this one is a muscler out towards the right field line. Will that one stay fair? It will not. It'll get foul. Counts will be two and two on Scott. Had a chance for a little bloop. Double down the line, perhaps. Yeah, but K.O. Thomas was dead set on trying to catch up to that one. But I think Jimmy Kerr knew that one was going to end up falling foul. It's kind of a scorcher of a day here. It so I think he was interested in conserving <laughs> energy. He's standing halfway in the shade while Akeo Thomas is nicely shaded. 
Uh, Steven Scott didn't move at the plate either. He saw that one was going foul the whole way. The runner on first, Philip Clark was booking it towards second. Doesn't matter those. So now a 2 2 pitch from Henry about to be delivered. That's on its way. Foul back to the screen, still 2 and 2. Good job of Scott staying in this at bat. Of course, uh, Tommy Henry only threw seven pitches in the last at bat in the last inning, so no one really did a good job of running up his pitch count. It's only at 17 through one and a third, so very good start for him. Going the distance is, of course, unlikely, especially so against this Vanderbilt team, but Michigan is going to want to muster all they can out of him before maybe a Jeff Criswell sighting even. And we talked to head coach Eric Backage, so he's going to pull out all the stops today as Henry comes set, 2-2 two -two pitch. Swinging and a miss, strike three on the slider. He gets a MLB draft pick swinging again here for his third strikeout of the day. That'll bring up Harrison Ray with two outs and that runner still on first. Yeah, Tommy Henry really peaking at the best time for his team, maybe not the best time for his paycheck <laughs> as he brings his best stuff shortly after the MLB draft. But, uh, you know, I don't think he's too bummed about that as right now he has put his team up for nothing in the first game of the College World Series, holding one of the best teams in college baseball scoreless through one and two-thirds. Harrison Ray, the second baseman for Vanderbilt, steps up, lefty to righty. Henry looks in for the sign. First pitch to Ray. Fastball swing and a miss, strike one. Blew it right by him there, did Tommy Henry. As perhaps looking for that nasty slider was Ray. He was just behind that first pitch fastball. 0-1 on the junior second baseman. Comes in batting 275 on the season, 361 on base percentage. Has tons of speed when he gets on the bases. 21 stolen bases, leads the Vanderbilt squad. And also has some doubles power, 18 doubles, a couple of triples on the year, just like two home runs. Takes a 0-1 breaking ball down low, it's 1-1. Yep, it'd be great for Tommy Henry to get out of the inning now and maybe try to separate Austin Martin from the rest of the top of that lineup. Definitely don't want him batting with anyone on base. Yeah, Henry very easily could have been out of this inning already. That little bloop liner towards Blake Nelson. Had he not been looking right into the sun, might have been able to field that one. He gets a chance here. Ground ball off his glove at third base. He keeps it near him, so the runners will not be able to advance more than one bag. But that'll definitely go as a single down the line. A hard hit ground ball for Harrison Ray. And there's two runners on, two outs for Vanderbilt. And I think Blake Nelson would really love to get out of this inning and maybe have another long inning for Michigan in the third and maybe let these shadows just grow a little bit more and kind of cover his entire body. That might have been another one where vision was an issue. He's standing right on the edge of where the light touches and the third base bag now securely in the shade. He's playing, though, a few, few feet away from it and squarely in the sun. Uh, and Jack Lomgren also in the sun out there, but the angle that he looks in at the plate with isn't nearly as tough as looking in from that third base spot. You're looking directly in the line of the sun if you're Blake Nelson towards home plate where Ty Duval is standing, the designated hitter. First pitch to him, foul up to the left side, out of play, off the bat of the lefty. The count's 0-1. And now Vanderbilt getting a runner in scoring position. Tommy Henry held Florida State to an 0 for 6 in, with runners in scoring position. Uh, they were also 0 for 10 with runners on base, so. And, and that seems like a high number for three hits given up all day, yeah. but the reason was those hits were given up with nobody out in the inning, and then he just worked through it, so that's three right there. Yeah, this is the most runners he's had behind him. 0-1 pitch, call, strike on the outside corner with a fastball, 0-2 now. Has only had to worry about one base runner all World Series long, so the first test of this kind for him did have two runners in scoring position thanks to two doubles he gave up. Two of the only three hits he conceded. That's Clark on second, the catcher, and the speedy second baseman Harrison Ray on first. Should Duvall find a gap, that will certainly score a couple runs for Vanderbilt. 0-2 pitch. Tries for that breaking ball. Thought about swinging to Duvall, and Donovan framed it on the outside corner, but didn't get the call, and the count's 1-2. and two. And you might have been able to catch a few of those groans coming from the Michigan faithful here. They are probably here in good numbers. I, they sounded really good right there. There's <laughs> maze speckled all around here. We can't see the Michigan fan section. It's right beneath us. Calling time at the plate is Duval. As Henry was already about to come set, ready for his one-two pitch, maybe try, try to throw him off his rhythm a little bit. And As there are a few notable Michigan fans here in attendance we might touch on at the end of this inning. Henry's one-two pitch. Tries for the fastball this time, but can't catch the outside corner. It's two and two now, so... Henry, I imagine those pitches definitely on purpose off the outside corner, trying to get the chase with the slider on that second time, maybe trying to get 
Duvall thinking it was a slider and paint that outside corner, but just missed with it there. The count's going to be two and two on the designated hitter for Vanderbilt. Yep, second one to draw, second one in a row to draw some moans from the band, from the Michigan fans here, rather. Tommy Henry comes set at the stomach, 2-2 pitch. This one's a line drive towards the right center field gap. That one's going to get down. Jordan Brewer fields in the right center field gap. He comes up throwing towards second base, and Vanderbilt's going to score a run here in the bottom of the second to score. Michigan 4, Vanderbilt 1. And Tommy Henry gives up his first run here at the College World Series and draws up a very dangerous batter due up now, but... He's, his offense has give, put him in the position where he can afford to make that mistake. There's still a runner on third. This could become a two-run game very quickly, but this could be a lot worse for Michigan. They have not trailed for long here. Had one out in the bottom of the second before they tied things back up during a very brief deficit to Texas Tech. So they're used to playing with that lead, and they should still have it after this one unless Julian Infante can uh, go the distance here. Yeah, that's just a great piece of hitting there from... Ty Duvall down 0-2 in the count. Watched a couple pitches just miss off the plate away before putting a two-strike pitch in the right center field. Uh, we'll bring up Julian Infante, the first baseman for Vanderbilt. Guy with plenty of power, but just a 238 hitter overall. Lefty to righty. Henry looks at the runner at first base and fires a pitch that gets past Joe Donner at the plate. Runs going to come in to score easily is Ray. And Duvall will move up to second. That should go down as a pass ball probably on Joe Donovan, something that's haunted him all year. And Vanderbilt has cut the Michigan lead in half here in the second. It's 4-2. to two. And those are going to be two costly errors Michigan will have to think about. The Jordan Wogu attempt to advance to third, and now that one. This could be a 5-1 ball game had things gone slightly differently. Tommy Henry now giving up two runs there. That one perhaps maybe more so falling on Joe Donovan, who had has definitely struggled with, with past balls. Has been pretty good in Omaha, though, with that. Has already given up three hits, mashing his total versus Florida State, a team with certainly a lot less offense than Vanderbilt. So 1-0 count on Infante, runner on second now in scoring position. He fouls off a fastball off the glove of Donovan this time, and the count is 1-1. One one. Yep, and that advances the down by one run to scoring position, so we'll see what... Henry can do about this. This could be a one-run ball game very possibly by the time Michigan comes back up to the plate and with the top of the Vandy lineup due up. We'll see if we'll see either of those two are two distinct possibilities. We'll see. 12 home runs on the year for Infante, so he certainly could be thinking to tie this one up right now. Henry looks back at the runner on second and fires a 1-1 pitch called. Strike on the outside part with the slider. It's 1-2. and two. And this is big for Henry, uh, much like his teammate Carl Kaufman having some hiccups here in the second inning. Kaufman was able to ride the storm. He gave up three runs in that inning, but ultimately was excellent from that point onward. We'll see if Henry can deal with his first true adversity here in Omaha. He's up in the count, 1-2 on Infante, who is very strikeout prone, leads this Vanderbilt team, or tied for the lead in strikeouts with... Steven Scott, who already struck out in this inning, and now he swings and misses on a 1-2 pitch, strike three. Three strikeouts in the inning for Tommy Henry, but Vanderbilt scatters three singles in there to score two runs in the second. We'll head to the third inning. Michigan leads Vanderbilt by a score of 4-2. to two. You are listening to the official student radio broadcast of Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. Yep, and he gets all three out swinging. He had more fielding help in the top of the first, bottom of the first, rather, no errors recorded, but Blake Nelson does have two he might want back. It was asking a lot for him. Two hard hit balls coming right at him with the sun definitely having an effect on both of those, both going down as infield hits. But two that maybe just with a bit, if he made a good play rather than just the acceptable play, would have gotten out of those. And we had a chance to speak to Blake Nelson yesterday after Michigan's practice here at TD Ameritrade Park. Asked him about some of the senior moments and one of the moments against Illinois that brought them to this point to get to the College World Series. So you kind of talked uh, in press conferences, a lot of the guys have talked about the seniors, about how uh, you came down to one strike away from ending your career back last time you were in Omaha. 
but now you, you just keep playing, you're kind of savoring every moment. And, uh, what's kind of the mindset been for you, someone that's kind of transferred here, been here for a couple of years, and uh, is now in the college world? Um, you know, it's, it's been a special couple of years. Uh, just the, the upperclassmen kind of showed me what it means to play for Michigan. And, you know, I only got to be here for two years, but, you know, I grew to love Michigan a lot and kind of feels like a second home to me. Um, so this, this year especially, to be my last year and, you know, playing for the, the eight letters on the front of our chest just kind of means so much to me. And it was it was an emotional feeling that that game against Illinois because, you know, we were, we were looking our careers dead in the face and, you know, it did feel like maybe it could end right there, and just to kind of have that, you know, not be our last time, just kind of, kind of put things into perspective for us. I know for me personally, it did, and uh, just kind of living in the moment a little bit more, and just kind of embracing everything that's happened, and just enjoying the ride instead of thinking too much, kind of thing. That was Blake Nelson. We talked to him. We mentioned him a couple times last inning. For just having a tough go of it over there because of the sun. He'll be second this inning after Jimmy Kerr. And Kerr leads off this top of the third inning by taking a Reich on the outside corner. 0-1 to him. Kerr struck out in his first plate appearance back in the first. And working quickly as fellows, Kerr tries to lay down a bunt down the left field line as no one is over there. The third baseman, Austin Martin, playing all the way near the second base bag almost. But Kerr bunts it foul and it's 0-2. And a couple of hours before you got to talk to Blake Nelson, Jimmy Kerr at the press conference told us about a similar so story from that moment. He takes an 0-2 pitch high with the fastball. It's now 1-2 and two on Kerr. As Jimmy Kerr sharing with the media at the press conference, an emotional moment he had with Blake Nelson following that Illinois game as they were very excited to keep their careers going. 1-2 pitch to Kerr. Swing and a miss. Strike three. Got him with the fastball there. Did Fellows. And there's one out to start the third. So two strikeouts to start for the guy who's been having the best offensive time here in Omaha of anyone. As we mentioned, he basically owns or shares the lead for every single offensive stat that could really matter. He's maybe stolen bases he hasn't been so hot on. But uh, I mean, part of that's because he hits home runs. Does exactly. No base running for him to do beside a quick little trot. First pitch here to Blake Nelson called strike one. Nelson upset at the plate. I think he asked for time from Jeff Henricks as... Working extremely quickly with Drake Fellows. Nelson wanted time to get set in the batter's box. This time, Hendricks gives it to him, and now an 0-1 pitch to Nelson. Call strike two with another fastball. And they've been giving time very leniently all World Series here. Maybe a couple times where they shouldn't have they when the pitcher was already set to throw. They've granted it, so Blake Nelson uh, understandably upset with that one. 0-2 pitch. Call strike three on the outside corner with another fastball. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, says Drake Fellows. Three fastballs gets Nelson. He struck out two in this inning, three overall. And there's two outs for Christian Bullock. And Eric Backage is going to use, or rather, Christian Bullock on his own walking a little back towards the dugout to take his time, get in the plate, perhaps again, just trying to disrupt the rhythm of Drake Fellows, who really seemed to find it there on the first two batters. Yep, and we've talked about uh, not thinking too much. We heard Blake Nelson use those words. Michigan now, they had a really nice start, but they're going to have to weather the storm now. They had their first hiccups. We'll see if they start thinking too much now. Bullock fouled out to the catcher over by the third base line back in the first inning. Takes the first pitch low and away. 1-0 on him this time. We'll have to see if Michigan can calm the nerves, maybe not think, oh my gosh, we're up in this college world series. Not get, not let the moment get too big. Eric Backage described that multiple times here. That's been a thing that Eric Backage has been preaching all week long. Don't make the moment too big. It's just baseball here. So 1-0 pitch to Bullock is an off-speed pitch. Rather, fastball catches the outside corner. 1-1. One one. Yep, the team got to take pictures with the national championship trophy yesterday, but Eric Backage had reminded us at his press conference. 1-1 one, one pitch, swing and a miss. Good breaking ball moving down into Bullock. He was looking to hit that one a long ways and came up empty. It's 1-2. and two. Beckett wanted to make sure it was known that that was a earned celebration, but they were not going to be letting that get to their heads. 1-2 pitch, not a Bullock. Foul back to the screen. 1-2 and two remains the count as the Vanderbilt fans back behind their dugout under the overhang rise to their feet in preparation here for perhaps a third straight strikeout in the inning. And as Fellows is really set, settling in, it's quite tragic for him that he's about to throw pitch number 63. 1-2 pitch, swing and a miss, strike three. Got him with the pitch moving down and in against Bullock. Three strikeouts in a row for Fellows that inning. 
He's got four on the day overall. We'll head to the bottom of the third inning. Michigan still leads Vanderbilt by a score of four to two. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. Austin Buckle alongside Daniel Thompson bringing you the action today. And we're bringing you more than just the action as here between innings. We want a little audience participation in our YouTube chat here. We love to hear where you guys are listening from. And we're bringing you the Planet Subs Omaha trivia question of the game. I know we did a little bit of trivia last game. So you get a shout out here for the first one to answer correctly. No Googling. But Daniel Thompson, what do you got for us? Yep, we'll have the answer for you in the next inning. But, of course, it's been said ad nauseum now that if Michigan should win this, it will be their first championship in 57 years. And that, you're probably thinking, would have to be a record, and you would be right. What? But the trivia question is, what is the current longest route between titles, and which team was the one that won it? We'll accept... Uh, we're looking for the complete answer, but you'll get partial credit if you can get either the school that currently holds the record for the longest span between titles and how many years it was. So a school that had won two titles, the longest between them, or at least two titles, the longest drought between those two titles. And yeah, we're not saying the longest between their first and their most recent, but the longest between not winning a single title and then winning your second. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take a minute to sit on it myself. I'll try to come up with something in the next inning here. Got to go off my knowledge of recently walking past all the winners listed along the <laughs> outfield wall or on the outside of the outfield wall, right field here at TD Ameritrade Park and around the concourse. They have all the winners listed there as well. Yep, anyone who has come to a game in Omaha certainly has an upper hand here as photos of one. They have like five-year blocks of all the teams that won in a five-year stretch and a photo of at least one of those teams, so... If you've been here, it certainly will help. Uh, if you're listening from the stands, I don't know why you are, but uh, <laughs> you could quickly take a jog around the concourse and solve this one for yourself. Leading off the inning is the top of the Vanderbilt order in Austin Martin. Dangerous hitter, hit one off the inside of the bat to Blake Nelson to start off Vanderbilt's day with the very first pitch. This time he takes the fastball high, maybe a bit in as well, and the count's 1-0 and on. And Blake Nelson is now fully shaded. So the ball's hit over there towards Blake Nelson. Should be able to make a play this time. A little tough liner in the sun. We'll see what Austin Martin does here. 1-0 pitch. He hits one in the air. A little pop fly and foul ground. Jimmy Kirk giving chase on the right side. He tries to slide over to the Michigan dugout, but that's out of his reach. The count's going to be 1-1. One and, one. and I'm sure Joe Donovan wishes he had one back when Philip Clark popped one up behind him, and Joe Donovan could not quite get to it. Jimmy Kerr right there just a step behind that ball. That ball was quite as close to a dugout. Might have given it an all-out dive. Instead, went with the slide to avoid going headfirst into the railing or the camera well down there. So the count's one and one on Martin here. Henry in the sun. The plate in the shade as he winds up 1-1 pitch. Fastball high and in, ball two. Yep, he's the next one to get some shade relief. Is that going to try to do some sundial math right here? The uh, shade is about maybe four or five minutes from reaching him. Not a bad thing for a pitcher if you're releasing the ball in the sun. Takes that extra second for a hitter to pick it up. As the wind up here and a 2-1 offering to Martin is a line drive over the head of Jack Blomgren into left center field. Christian Bullock's going to chase it down. We'll see if Martin tries for a second. He will stay at first as Bullock gets it back in quickly. And it's a leadoff single here in the third for Vanderbilt. Looking to attack a couple more runs on and bite into that Michigan lead a little more. Yep, we'll see if Tommy Henry can defensively weather the storm. And weather the storm going on in his brain right now, I'd imagine... It, he has only given up three hits going into this game. No runs, of course, in that 100-pitch complete game. Right now, already given up four hits, two runs against him. So we'll see what he can do here against the top of the Vanderbilt lineup. Henry working out of the stretch here yet again for the second straight inning. Looks over at Martin on first base, a threat to steal for sure, and fires a first pitch to J.J. Bladey up. It's a foul pop-up behind the plate. Joe Donovan runs all the way over to the screen. Does he have room over there? He does have room just in front of the screen. Couldn't have been more than six inches to a foot away from touching the screen. Now that's a foul pop-out and a big first out in the third. And that is huge for them. Third time is the charm with those foul pops up, pop-ups. Third one where we could have easily been touched by either player, but that one Joe Donovan finally gets. Gets some redemption for that pass ball and the foul ball they couldn't chase down in the previous inning. And that's huge. Anytime you can get out of the top of the Vanderbilt lineup like that and not have the ball travel toward the outfield whatsoever is a huge win for any pitcher. 
Tommy Henry looks in for the sign now to throw to Ethan Paul. Checks the runner on first. Austin Martin a couple times in a first pitch. Squaring on a bunt is Paul, and he takes a strike with the fastball. 0-1 on him. Curious strategy here. I think Paul is just too good of a hitter to be laying down a bunt right now. I mean, don't give an out away with a runner on first. That's not the way these two coaches play. They play to get runs any way they can, no matter what part of the lineup you're in. And Ethan Paul, who struck out on three pitches against Henry, perhaps strategically bunting with a guy who maybe isn't seeing Henry quite as well. Pick off throw to first base, Austin Martin's back in, and that one I think was as much to see if Paul was squaring on a bunt again as it was to try to pick off Austin Martin. And of course, these two coaches have more than just philosophy in common. More to come on that story as we get go throughout this game. Henry comes set at the stomach, looks at Martin again, who's got 18 stolen bases on the year. Takes a long look at him, and now fires an 0-1 pitch. Swing and a miss at a slider. It's 0-2. That pop fly might have been the break that Tommy Henry needed to get back in this one. Looking to have his groove back as he's retired four via strikeout already. One pitch away from number five. Clark went down on three pitches in the first. Henry looking to do that same thing here in the third with one out and a runner on. Henry puts that ball behind his back. Now comes set at the stomach. Doesn't even look at Martin this time and fires no two pitch that just misses low. Maybe a bit off the plate away as well. And the count's one and two on Paul. Paul, another guy in this Vanderbilt lineup that does strike out a fair amount 61 times for just 30 walks on the year. And certainly against a lefty like Tommy Henry, who has some nasty stuff, could be in trouble of going down for a second time today. One two pitch. It's the ground ball up the middle. Jack Lyman's going to field. He'll take it a second by himself and throw the first scoop over there by Jimmy Kerr for double play. And there you have it. What a way to respond. Austin Martin leads off and. I'm sure every Michigan player out there on the field right now, their minds had to be ticken slowly, but they did a great job making, not making the moment too big. That was a really hard hit, scary ground ball. Could have easily done a lot of damage. Instead, the heads up play from Blomgren steps on the bag and it, it completes the one hop throw to Jimmy Kerr. Yeah, a little off balance throw from Jack Blomgren there. Stepped on the base with the wrong foot as you would normally step and throw with and fired a ball that was a really tough pick by Jimmy Kerr, but the first baseman dug it out and Michigan gets out of the inning without any damage. We'll head to the fourth inning here at TD Ameritrade Park. The score, Michigan 4, Vanderbilt 2. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on game one of the College World Series Finals. Best of three series between Michigan and Vanderbilt to determine who will be this year's 2019 NCAA Baseball National Champion. Yep, and I don't know if uh, Jack Longgren meant to hop that ball to first base, but ultimately it, <laughs> it worked out kind of like a basketball chess pass, taking a hop real close to the man who he intended to get the ball to, and Jimmy Kerr keeping composure, the senior, not going to shy away from the moment. It's in his blood. Of course, his grandfather won a national championship as a pitcher for Michigan all the way back in 1962, what could have been the aforementioned 57-year streak to be broken. Uh, you guys still have another Michigan trip through the lineup to try to get to try to crack that puzzle. Yeah, we'll give another half inning here uh, before we get the answer to our Planet Subs Omaha trivia question. Again, if you're joining us, you didn't catch it the first time. What's the longest drought between two titles for NCAA baseball? I mean, she had to have won a title and had a long drought and then won another one after that drought. Titles outside of that span are irrelevant, but a team like Michigan would not qualify because they have not won that title after their long drought at least not yet as they would like you to think this week yeah I don't think a nine-year drought really counts as a as a long one uh, I'm, I'm gonna take a guess here just just purely guessing based on seeing a couple names early on and say USC but that, that, that'll be my guess we'll see their name certainly happening. is up here a lot on that concourse I know it's up here a lot I'm just taking that guess based off of that Jack Blomgren's going to lead things off here in the top of the fourth inning for Michigan. He walked and came around to score his first time at the plate in the second. Takes the first pitch low and away, ball one. So Drake Fellows might not be dealing quite the way he was in the last inning as he retired three very quickly. 1-0 pitch to Blomgren, misses low and away, ball two. And as you mentioned, Fellows came out after struggling in the first couple innings with walks and very hittable pitches for Michigan. Struck out the side in the third in order. He has a 2-0 count here on Blomgren, who takes the first pitch, or rather a third pitch fastball for the first strike of the at-bat. 2-1. and one. 
Bellows come, came into this inning with 63 pitches through three innings. The Vanderbilt bullpen has gone quiet after that striking out the side. 2-1 pitch, breaking ball down and away, but Blomgren went around on the swing. It's now 2-2. Two two. Blomgren able to get on first through his eye way back in the first inning. Five runs ago, I believe that was. Blomgren, the right-hander against the right-hander, fellows. 2-2 pitch. Misses low and way, very close there. It's ball three on the fastball. Trying to frame it was the catcher back there, Philip Clark, but couldn't quite bring it back at the knees on the outside corner and get the call from Jeff Henricks. So it's 3-2, winding up the payoff pitch. This one is bounced towards third base. Austin Martin's kind of a tough play, ranging over near shortstop. He makes the play, but cannot make the throw. Didn't have a good grip on the ball, and Blomberg's got an infield single to start things in the fourth. Third time in th fourth innings that Michigan has had the leadoff runner on. And the third infield single we've seen in this ball game. So there you go. Hit it to the opposite side of the infield, and you'll give yourself a chance. Of course, this Michigan team is very speedy. And uh, Blomgren not really in the upper echelon of speed in this team. That's a very impressive task if you can be there. Yeah, this team, a very, very fast, very aggressive base running team. Blomgren has seven stolen bases himself on the year out of 11 tries. And I know at least a couple of those were pickoffs. Not straight up caught stealings. He's not going here as the first pitch to Joe Donovan is a call. To strike with a fastball with one. Donovan worked a full count walk after fouling off a two strike pitch in his first at bat back in the second, fouling up on Blomgren's walk. And as you mentioned, Michigan now on base to lead off in three of four innings, and they scored in the first two where they did that. Righty to righty. 0 1 pitch. Swing and a miss. Strike two. That one a good breaking ball. Donovan. Again, swinging with, for the fences there. A big swing. Thought he had a fastball right down the middle, but it dropped off the table, and it's 0-2. So now Donovan behind in this count while Blomgren was able to get a full count and then advance through an infield single. Donovan looked to stay alive against the tough breaking ball of Fellows. 0-2 pitch. Fastball foul back to the screen. Donovan has struggled against that good breaking ball righty on righty at times this season. We saw it in UCLA as well. Even when he was just mashing the ball, hitting everything, he got his bat on hard. He was chasing at times on that low breaking ball, that low breaking ball down and away. Got a fastball here and was able to stay alive. Yep, one of just a few Wolverines not to record a hit in that previous game, but did get on base twice and score a run thanks to his eyes getting walked twice. A pickoff throw. Jack Blomberg almost falls back to the bat. Wasn't taking a huge lead. He's down on his hands and knees as he gets back. The wave trying to be started on the bleachers here in TD Ameritrade Park. A very packed house here for a Monday night. Bellows going to come set. His arms go above his head, then he comes set at the chest. Blomgren not going here. 0-2 pitch foul back over the screen and off the press box. It remains 0-2 right near the Michigan box over there. We mentioned a few higher profile names in attendance here for Michigan. A few fellow head coaches made the trip to Omaha for this championship series. Shaka Daly of the Michigan men's soccer team, Kim barnes Arikio from the Michigan women's basketball team. Of course, Carol Hutchins, the Michigan softball coach, and Juwan Howard, the new men's basketball coach. All made the flight today together to come sit in the box with Ward Manuel, who's been here all week long. Pick off though, chases Blomgren back to the bag. And credit to Coach Hutch. He was here for the opening weekend back last Saturday. He gave Eric Backage a few words of advice and Another man gave Backage a few words of advice, and we'll get to that in a second here. Is another 0-2 pitch to Donovan. It's on the way. This is the ground ball. Now the left side. It's through the left side. Into left field for a base hit. Joe Donovan with the second straight single in the fourth. Michigan's got two runners on. Nobody out. The chance to extend their lead. And the 237 hitter gets on base here. Not what you want to see if you're Drake Fellows. Joe Donovan, not a bad hitter uh, by any means. He can go for power sometimes. Eight home runs on the year. None the least the one coming in Los Angeles in the UCLA Super Regional. And frustrating for Fellows, I'm sure he got the ground ball he probably wanted there to get himself out of the inning with the double play, but it just found the hole on the left side with Austin Martin playing in normal third base depth and the shortstop out there, Ethan Paul, playing in double play depth near second base. So a couple runners on, Vanderbilt going through some signs here, whether that's the signs from the catcher, how they want to play double steals, or more likely a bunt with the KO Thomas at the plate. Thomas squared out a bunt a couple times in his first at-bat before poking one off the end of the bat down the left field line for an RBI double. Same situation here with runners on first and second. Takes the first pitch. Low and away, ball one. 
And as we mentioned in the first in, or second inning, rather, Joe Donovan, not a speedster, no attempted stolen bases on the year. So something Vandy, I'm sure, is aware of and aren't going to be super obsessed with the thought of him going to second and, you know, third not stolen that often. So I think they're going to line themselves up here for the bunt. Bonte creeps in. Corners in for sure. It's okay. Thomas puts it down the third base line, but that's going to be foul. So the Bunners will have to go back to their bags, and it'll be a 1-1 count on the Wolverine second baseman. And had that one gone a little bit further to the right, that would have done the job. Looked like Blom, Grenand, Donovan would have cruised safely into second and third, and Thomas likely would have gotten beaten out. But that would have put two runners in scoring position for the scariest hit leadoff hitter in college baseball. That is the words of Michigan baseball Twitter, not ours. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we think they're pretty accurate. Yeah, Jordan Wogu, one of the best leadoff hitters in the country. He's got a really good one on the other side yeah. of the diamond. though. That might be the true scariest leadoff hitter in yeah. college baseball, Austin Martin. But Wogu, easily the scariest in the Big Ten, in my humble opinion. Runners on first and second here. K.O. Thomas going to square on one, two. Again, he bunts it right back towards the pitcher. Fellows is going to field, throw to first base in time, but a sacrifice bunt moves two runners into scoring position with one out for Jordan Wogu. So the senior, who has been a huge part of this team for four straight years, gets the job done, done what, does what he's asked, and has really left his mark in this game already with a single and now a bunt, laying it down on the line to get, get his two teammates to second and third. And here, yep, here we just mentioned the but debatably the scariest leadoff hitter in college baseball. And hey, those two guys are both sophomores, him and Martin, so they can duke it out for that title next year. Yeah, who knows? Both teams that have plenty of talent coming back or coming into the program next season would not be surprised to see these two teams meet up, perhaps in another postseason matchup. But that's a long way down the line. We're here in 2019 with Jordan Wogu, runners on second and third. He takes the first pitch and swings and misses at a breaking ball low and away. Counts 0-1 chases that one and against Drake Fellows who already is, has not walked anyone yet in this inning but off to one of his worst starts of the year when it comes to walks I think he needs to make Fellows throw him a ball that he wants to see yeah Wogu walked in his first at bat grounded out in his second at bat where he had runners on second and third with nobody out this time there's one out in the inning the 0-1 pitch to Wogu another breaking ball low and away this one he takes for ball one doesn't go chasing there and maybe he has gotten accustomed two Drake Fellows at this point already did get, did get walked early as he got up 3-0 in that count. Fellows looks in for the sign with the glove on his left thigh, the ball behind his back. And as you mentioned, comes out with his feet and the arms go up in the air before he comes down near the stomach. Fires a 1-1, breaking ball, low and away again, it's 2-1. And, and that's three straight low, so he's going to have to either trick Wogu on inside, outside, or maybe drop one in the bread basket, which you never want to do against a guy like this. I wouldn't be surprised to see one of those breaking balls that starts in the zone and drops just out of it. Get Wogu swinging and missing on 2-1. As pitch number 81 is on the way for Drake Fellows. We're here in just the fourth inning. Action again in the Vanderbilt bullpen, this time a lefty warming up. Again, can't quite see the number all the way out there in the left field corner. 2-1 pitch to Wogu. This one's muscled off down the right side. That'll be foul and out of play into the camera well. And you can hear that chime off the stairs all the way up here, playing it almost like a ch church organ, hitting those uh, the railing on that staircase down to the camera well. Counts going to be 2-2 on Jordan Wogu. Fellows be a huge out to get here, especially if it's a strikeout without letting Wogu put the ball in play. As the corners for Vanderbilt, they're playing about even with the baseline, the infield, middle infield playing back. 2-2 pitch, breaking ball, low and away, ball three. Full count and the danger of walking the bases loaded right here if Fellows loses control of this one. It's a moment where I'm glad I'm not out there on the mound, that's for sure. <laughs> Certainly the biggest stage in college baseball here, the College World Series Finals. The junior Drake Fellows out there struggled early on, looked really good in the third, but has since went into a little bit of trouble here in the fourth. Looking to get a big strikeout here perhaps on 3-2. He comes set, the pitch. Just barely getting a piece of it there was Wogu. He was late on the swing for the fastball, but he fouled it behind him, and the count remains 3-2. and two. Yep, if nothing else, Wogu is driving up that Drake Fellows pitch count, but at some point you have to cash that tired arm in for runs, not just taking him out of the game. But Michigan, their starter almost certainly is going to go longer in this one, and that's to their advantage, a team that certainly needs to get any advantage they can take after a couple of mental errors earlier in this one. Wogu, his batting stance with his hands down almost near his hips before 
kind of pulling it back as Fellows comes set. Another 3-2 pitch. Again, just barely swinging at the last second. This time on a breaking ball was Wilgu. He gets a piece of it and fouls it near the on-deck circle where Jesse Franklin is standing, and the count's going to remain 3-2. and two. The very gifted hitter batting 325 is just able to think quickly there and get a piece of that one, extend the at-bat, really force Fellows to throw one that he likes. Pitch number 85 is on the way. That looked like a breaking ball that started in and was going to get over the plate, so Wilgu noticed he had to protect at the last second and got a piece. We'll see what happens here for Fellows on 3-2 again. Another one fouls straight back to the screen, another breaking ball, and the count's still 3-2 and two on Wogu. And that has to be frustrating for Drake Fellows. He cannot get rid of what has been a nightmare for many pitchers. He is scary. And uh, I'm sure Drake Fellows wants to get rid of him as soon as he can. Maybe get out of this inning with less than 90 pitches. Still 3-2 and two on Wogu, ninth pitch of the at-bat coming up. Fellows comes set, takes a breath, 3-2 again. This one is muscled right back to the mound. Fellows looks at third. Blomgren retreats there, and he fires one over to first base. Almost gets past for a second there. The first baseman, that's Julian Infante. He had to crouch down to grab it after it was uncorked by Fellows, but he gets a huge ground out back to the mound there, and there's two outs in the fourth. Yep, all that work for Wogu just to ground out. Uh, wisely there, Fellows putting that on the inside where Wogu isn't nearly as gifted of a hitter. That's the one thing he's going to have to work on if he really wants to elevate his game next season. But if nothing else, the pitch count is driven up to 86, but the foul, the sacrifice fly is now out of the discussion for Jesse Franklin, who's a guy who certainly is capable of doing that himself, but we'll see what he does to get on base. Fellows now having a mound meeting with some teammates. Yeah, have a mound visit here, perhaps to settle Fellows down just a little bit before facing a dangerous hitter in Jesse Franklin, who's been really locked in the last few days. Had that big home run back on Monday against Florida State a week ago. And on Friday, if I'm not mistaken, four hits in that ball game. He was on base a ton and just ripping the ball all over the place. Had a hard hit single in the first and an RBI ground out in the second so far today. Left-handed hitter walks down the first base line a bit to take his practice swing. A little odd quirk there as baseball players ought to have. Bellows prepares for a big at-bat. He's ready on the mound, ready for Franklin to step in there. Franklin does step in. We get righty-lefty here in a big spot. Two runners in scoring position, two outs in the fourth. Michigan leads 4-2. to two. Bellows comes set, first pitch. Misses high and away, ball one. Franklin already has a single on that play that, of course, resulted in Jordan Wogu getting beaten to third base. Might be five runs for Michigan right now had Wogu held up, but Franklin did sneak into second during that throw, the third. Franklin looks very, very comfortable in the box right now. We've seen times later in the year where he has not. He looks very dialed in right now, just waiting for Fellows to come with a 1-0 pitch. It misses outside, ball two. So Fellows survives a very long at bat versus Jordan Wogu just to get back down in the hole here versus Jesse Franklin. He got ahead of Wogu for a second there. Before Wogu was able to stay alive for a while. Almost, as you mentioned, just repetition here. So this one is a ground ball towards the right side. Fielding it over there is the second baseman. That's Ray. Throws to first base from shallow right field in time to retire the side. Michigan has two singles to lead off the inning but cannot score as they are retired on three ground outs afterwards. We'll head to the bottom of the fourth inning. The score on Michigan 4, Vanderbilt 2. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan Baseball here on WCBN Sports. And Daniel Thomas says we hit the middle of the fourth inning. I think it's about time to get the answer to our Planet Subs Omaha trivia question of the game. What you got for us, Daniel? Yep, well, this one might have been a bit of a stumper. Doesn't look like anyone in the comments got it right. We uh, do thank you for those who guessed. We had someone else, uh, Keaton Gaming, get, uh, guessed USC as well. Florida State mentioned, of course, Mike Martin being the head coach for 40 seasons. Couldn't quite ever win the big one, though, through 17 appearances in Omaha. No one quite got it, though. That 40-year stretch of Mike Martin was not enough to cover the entire drought that Oklahoma had between 1951 and 1994, beat, defeating Tennessee all the way back 
1951 and then defeating Georgia Tech in 1994. So that is the record Michigan is trying to break right now. 57 years would tack on 14 more to that record, so definitely would smash that one. 43 already is a pretty crazy drought to imagine breaking. Of course, in the very long history of college baseball, you're going to have some like that. Michigan is celebrating Team 153 right now. Eric Backich yesterday described how going into this season, they prepared throwback uniforms because they wanted to make sure that that Team 153 was going to leave a page mark that everyone would look back on in the years to come. And that they have. Uh, even if they come up empty here in the final series at the College World Series, they have left their mark. The first Big Ten team to get here in 53 years. Ohio State in 1966, the last one to do so. And you do have to understand that they are playing not only with all the Michigan fans' hopes riding on their shoulders, but the hopes of the Big Ten and really just the northern region of baseball all hoping on them. Uh, Oregon State, of course, the defending champs. That is a northern half of the country team, but the Pacific Northwest not really facing the same challenges that Midwestern teams do. First pitch here from Tommy Henry to lead off the inning against Philip Clark. Misses for ball one. And Philip Clark uh, got on base with the first pitch thrown to him by Tommy Henry back in the second inning. Didn't get much of a chance to talk about him, but he is a Major League Baseball draft pick too, despite being a sophomore. 1-0 pitch to him, swinging and a miss at an off-speed pitch, dropped right off the table from Henry, and the count's 1-1. One one. Philip Clark uh, turning 21 before the MLB draft, so he was eligible to go, even though he's a sophomore. The catcher was selected 267th overall in the ninth round by the Toronto Blue Jays, the third highest Vandy Commodore to get selected in last month's MLB draft. Lefty, lefty, 1-1 one, one pitch, just misses, and now it's 2-1. So we'll see if he can get on base again. Used an infield single to get to first with the first pitch of the second inning. What ultimately became a two-run inning as he would score. Henry looks in for the sign from Donovan with the glove in front of his face and then winds up for a 2-1 pitch. This is a softbound ground ball to the right side. Akeo Thomas comes in a couple steps, fields it on a couple hops, and throws to Jimmy Kerr for out number one. And that one was much easier to handle as now the entire infield is basically covered in shade. Just Jack Blomgren, who might sometimes be having to deal with the sunlight as it is just a little bit to the left of second base. He is hanging out in the shade as it is right now. But that could come into play still. As the shade kind of sweeps across the field here, the only one that's really in danger, I think, of looking into the sun and misjudging one is Christian Bullock out in left field. The only one really dealing with significant sun right now. Henry winds up, fires a first pitch to DeMarco. No swing, says first base umpire Perry Costello. The count's 1-0 on the center field there for Vanderbilt. DeMarco, he got swinging last time. Of course, he's the one who hit a pop fly back where the Joe Donovan nearly was able to haul. Henry's 1-0 offering is low and away. It bounces off the plate and back to the screen. It's 2-0 now. Good tactic to get that one out of the way while no one is on. <laughs> sure Henry's glad he was able to get Clark out because he would have been all the way to second by now, had a K.O. Thomas fumbled that play in one way or another. Yeah, a little bit of a funky spin on that throw from, or that pitch from Henry it was that slider, it hit right off the edge of the home plate and bounced awkwardly back to the screen. A swing and a miss here on a 2-0 fastball, comes up empty for DeMarco and it's 2-1 and one on the 294 hitter coming into the game, now a 292 hitter after the strikeout earlier on. Lefty to righty. Henry looks to the sign from Donovan, who's setting up low and in. 2 1 pitch. Misses low and in. Did it clip him? It did. It clipped DeMarco, maybe right on the knees. He tried to get out of the way, but he'll take his base down at first. He'll definitely take a base runner on with the Commodores. There's one on, one out for Steven Scott. So Tommy Henry putting a lot more on than he did in that Florida State game. Of course, facing better batters. That is going to happen, but. Hasn't had a nice clean inning since that first where he got them going down one, two, three, and only seven pitches. He's up to 47 right now for number 47, about to throw 48. On a decent pace, not really sure if the complete game is looking great right now, but that I don't think was ever the goal for him, just limit Vanderbilt to a handful of runs. Runner on first over there is DeMarco. First pitch here to the batter at the plate. Scott takes the first pitch strike. It's 0-1. 
Steven Scott struck out as well in his last trip to the plate, much like his teammate who just reached first. As we mentioned, a 10th round selection of the Boston Red Sox, so the fourth MLB year in this lineup. Oh, one pitch, breaking ball, misses low and away, ball one. And of course, even the guys who aren't officially going to the MLB yet might uh, are likely to get there one day. Of course, Austin Martin, most notably, will certainly be a very high pick in next year's draft. Yeah, talks of him going top five, top ten, maybe number one overall for the third baseman, but he's still a few batters away, luckily for Tommy Henry. He gets a lefty-on-lefty -lefty matchup here and throws a pickoff throw to keep DeMarco close at first base. DeMarco 6-for-9 on stolen bases this year. Vanderbilt, an aggressive team, not quite as aggressive as Michigan, but they definitely like to force the issue on the base paths when they get the chance. Especially down as they are right now, 4-2 to two to the Wolverines. Henry takes a look over to first a couple times and fires a pickoff move, not in time. Sliding back in head first again was DeMarco. Smooth uh, tag there by Jimmy Kerr nonetheless. I think Tommy Henry hit that exactly where Kerr wanted it to try to get a pickoff. Yeah, Henry doing that little move for the lefty, just steps off the back of the mound and fires the pickoff throw over his sidearm. Now he's going to come set. We'll see if he fires a 1-1 pitch. He does. It's hit high in the air towards right center field. Jesse Franklin's got a beat on it in almost straightaway center now. He makes the grab in the sunlight for the second out on the bottom of the fourth. Does a good job not losing that one as the overhang that shades the press box and the upper deck of fans is, its shadow is almost reaching him in center field. He's still got probably not till next inning till he gets fully shaded, but nonetheless makes a good play there. And I think that's the first fly ball to the outfield that Michigan has had to deal with so far. Yeah, they had a couple of those foul pop-ups that they weren't quite able to get to, but it's been all ground outs and strikeouts for Tommy Henry right now. It'll be Harrison Ray up to bat. He tries to screw around a bunt and takes a first pitch strike on an off-speed pitch. So a one looked like maybe the changeup from Tommy Henry moving low and away from a right-handed hitter. Tough pitch to bunt for Ray, the speedy second baseman who was Certainly bunting for a hit with two outs. It'd be big if he could get Ray out now and have Dufal and Infante do up before Martin. You always want to have two out and on when Austin Martin is due up. He can still score in that situation, as he's done twice already, homering. Henry checks to Marco at first. Now the 0-1 pitch to Ray. Misses outside. Ball one. Looks like he won't return to the bunt after tipping his hand right there. Michigan playing with a shift towards the left side. Blake Nelson playing just about on the line at third. Blomgren playing fairly normal as a shortstop, and Akeo Thomas ever so slightly shaded near the second base bag as the second baseman. Of course, Jimmy Kerr holding on the runner, so there's a big hole on the right side. The 1-1 pitch bounces off the plate with a fastball, and it goes to 2-1 on Ray. Yep, Joe Donovan having a bit of trouble with those low balls. Of course, Vandy's second run advancing thanks to a passed ball to Joe Donovan in the dirt. Does corral that one in the end, though. As you said, Ray one for one with a single on the air. Raises batting average a couple ticks to 278. Henry comes set, checks the runner. 2-1 pitch on the way. Swing and a miss. And it's 2-2. Two and two. It's been a while since he got that last strikeout way back in the bottom of the second inning. Retiring three via strikeout despite surrendering two runs. We'll see if he can get back in that groove as Vandy has certainly disrupted his rhythm a bit. Okay, last couple innings, having runners on early in the inning and making him work out of the stretch has certainly seemed to affect Henry a little bit. He stands on there on the mound, now finally gets his sign that he likes and comes set. Takes a big breath and taking a long time between the 2-2 two -two pitch and time is called out the plate by Ray, granted to him by Jeff Hendricks. And there you go, I think that's why Blake Nelson was upset earlier when he was not granted time as Tommy Henry looked just about ready to go there before time was awarded. That one looked fair enough. Yeah. I don't think Tommy Henry just didn't see Hendricks. He was staring down the runner at first to Marco. But Hendricks looks to have his hand up in plenty of time. This time Henry's 2-2. Breaking ball bounces low, it's 3-2. and two. Yep, another one that skips to Donovan. Tommy Henry's going to want to get a little bit better control under these as he is nearly through the fourth with pitch number 56 coming. I'm sure Coach Back is just hoping to get at least seven innings out of Henry before maybe handing the keys over to Jeff Criswell, who he said is absolutely in play for today. 
Reiner will be on the move for 3-2. This one is a ground ball towards third. Blake Nelson makes the play right on the third base bag. Throws in time to get him at first base for out number three. So Henry has a hit by pitch that inning, but otherwise retires the three batters around it. We head to the bottom of the, or the top of the fifth inning. Michigan leads Vanderbilt by a score of 4-2. to two. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan Baseball here on WCBN Sports. I'm Austin Falco alongside me, Daniel Thompson, bringing you the action today and throughout this championship series as we have all college world series long and as well as the Big Ten tournament and all regular season games over at the Fish in Ann Arbor. Certainly as Tommy Henry not only gets out of the inning but sets himself up nicely, it's going to be two big at-bats for Duvall and Infante. Henry will desperately want to retire them without any drama so he can get the dreaded Austin Martin up with none on and two out as Drake Fellows does return to the mound. There was no action in that Vanderbilt bullpen while they were up to bat, but we do see a few pitchers and catchers going out there to warm up. You'd have to think this is likely Drake Fellows' last inning unless he can have one like the third where he retired three in a hurry. Well, he's facing a part of the order that was part of that one, two, three, third. That was the four, five, six hitters in the Michigan order. He gets three, four, five here in the fifth. Brewer, Kerr, and Nelson. So righty, lefty, righty. Brewer has hit a couple hard hit balls off of Fellows thus far, a double and a line out. Kerr, though, has not had luck against the big right-hander. Two strikeouts, both swinging. Nelson's got split results, RBI single, and a strikeout looking. Yep, and of course, uh, Jordan Brewer had that double that very nearly could have been a triple. Probably could have gotten into third standing up, but he fell down on the way there and had to just kind of crawl back to second in shame. Uh, as he hit one perfectly for a triple, hiding in that right field corner in a very large TD Ameritrade park. This definitely is a triple hitter's ballpark. Not one for the home run hitters, but Jimmy Kerr has not been deterred by that as he is due up next already going the distance twice against Texas Tech in back-to-back at-bats, hammering home solo home runs. Maybe Jordan Brewer can give him the opportunity to get his first multi-run homer of the College World Series. Jordan Brewer going to start things off here in the fifth. Righty, righty, first pitch breaking ball. Way ahead of it is Brewer, but he gets a piece of it and follows it near the camera well on the left field side. Counts 0-1 on the Big Ten Player of the Year. Fellows working quickly now. Likes to work quickly out of the windup if he gets in a groove. Now the 0-1 fastball foul back to the screen, and it's 0-2. 0-2 in a hurry for Brewer, as Drake Fellows is having the kind of inning he needs to stay in this one. Pitch 92 is going to be on the way. He'll have to retire them quickly to get out of this one. Brewer second at bat started off 0-2. He worked it to 2-2 before lining out. Takes an 0-2 pitch inside. Had a kind of shimmy out of the way of that one, and it's one ball, two strikes on the Michigan right fielder. Bellows takes the breath, winds up, working quickly, one-two pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. Got him with the fastball, blew it right by him. The guard in the hair says 92, but as we said, we're pretty sure it's a few ticks low. And there's one out in the fifth. And pretty impressive right there from Drake Bellows, still being able to get in that probably mid-90s range, despite being in the 90s pitch count, too. I believe that was pitch number 92 or 93, I think. 92. As Jimmy Kerr is going to step up. He is two of the five strikeouts from Drake Fellows today. Righty, lefty, first pitch. Hit in the air down the left field line a bit. Now more over towards straightaway left field is Scott. He shields his eyes from the sun and makes the grab without a problem. Two outs quickly here in the fifth. Yep, that might have been a bit more fun for Jimmy Kerr than a strikeout, but ultimately equally harmless as that one gently sailed into outfield. So a rare 0 for 3 start for Jimmy Kerr, who has been... Just phenomenal with the bat as now Blake Nelson's going to come up to the plate. So maybe Drake Fellows has bought himself another inning. He might get out of this one still in the double digits and looking really good so far. Returning to that form he had in the third inning and keeping things more difficult for Tommy Henry and the Michigan defense. Blake Nelson putting a little bit of pine tar or something there. I don't think they really used the pine tar for the metal bats, but really working on his bat before he comes up to the plate. Perhaps stalling to try to get Fellows out of rhythm or making a point after he was not granted time at the first pitch of last at-bat. He steps into the box and Fellows fires almost immediately with the first pitch fastball that swung on and missed 0-1. He seemed to find his groove as he's given up seven hits in each of his last two outings. One, of course, only took four innings versus Duke, but he's only given up six here, so 
0-1 pitch to Nelson. Fastball missed inside. It's 1-1. Drake Fellows really settling in, but his issue was that all those hits came in the same innings. One and two. Also had a couple in inning number four. The walks were an issue early on as well. It's a 1-1 pitch to Nelson. Breaking ball called strike two. But ultimately not wisely timing when he put runners on the bases. <laughs> Having a great third and so far a stellar fifth. He's working quickly, fires a 1-2 pitch to Nelson. This one's back behind the plate over the screen and Ooh. into the club seats. It that, remains 1-2. and two. Yep, that one was a few feet to the right of winding up in the Michigan Athletic Department club seat. Maybe head coach Dewan Howard or any of the Michigan coaches here today could have got that one. I think I trust Carol Hutchins to make that play more than anybody. <laughs> True. So one other 1-2 offering to Blake Nelson. Swinging and a missed strike three and a breaking ball in the dirt. He is tagged out by the catcher, Clark. Two more strikeouts that inning for Drake Fellow. Six on the day total, and we'll head to the bottom of the fifth. We're halfway home here at TD Ameritrade Park. Michigan leads Vanderbilt 4-2. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast from Michigan Baseball here on WCBN Sports, bringing you game one of the three-game College World Series finals here in 2019 between the Michigan Wolverines and the Vanderbilt Commodores. Yep, as Fellows escapes that innings with only 98 pitches thrown, there is no action right now in the Vandy bullpen. One pitcher just throwing the ball against the wall back to himself, it looks like, from what I can see from 400 feet away. But as we're talking there, yeah, Carol Hutchins, the uh, the most qualified uh, sport coach here. But uh, Juwan Howard, you know, with that NBA player frame, might have the reach to go grab that ball away from anyone in that dug out as he sure surely has a long wingspan to catch anything but we teased it earlier another Michigan basketball coach uh, had a special message for coach Eric Backage during the Corvallis Regional yeah right before Michigan really started their run former Michigan head coach John Beeline who at that point had already departed for Cleveland uh, sent head coach Eric Backage and the team a good video message that he said he played for the Michigan team and which Beeline as we've heard him in press conferences before and talking in quotes and to the media before talking about outliers and how you have to believe in outliers believe in those guys that come in that weren't expected to do great things doing great things and Michigan certainly did so back in that Corvallis region though Jack Blomgren hurting his back Riley Bertram the backup and probably a starter for next season coming in playing extremely well had a four for four day and a hit by pitch to get on base the first game that he started in his Michigan career uh, we've seen a guy like Christian Bullock come in when Jordan Brewer was hurt and excel to the point where he's playing left field now after Jordan Brewer's come back. Uh, things like that that John Beeline preached and the Michigan team really took to heart and has really uh, embraced here on this run. Yep, as all three of Michigan seniors in the starting lineup are infielders, so Riley Bertram will definitely get a shot next year. An outlier going to become a a name stay next year in Ann Arbor. Ty Duvall is going to lead things off here in the bottom of the fifth. Takes the first pitch high and away. 1-0 is the count on the man who had an RBI single in the second. The only RBI for Vanderbilt today. The other run coming in unearned on a pass ball. We have bat after him to Julian Infante who is on deck right now. Henry takes a breath. 1-0 pitch. This one's a ground ball up the middle. Jack Blomgren played it perfectly right by the second base bag. He throws to first in time for out number one in the bottom of the fifth. And has all day to line up a perfect throw. The last two innings were ended with uh, Jimmy Kerr having to dip down to get two balls, but that one was quite easy for him. Six foot two, he's got a pretty long reach, and that came in handy to end the third and the fourth innings. Michigan off to a great start in the fifth. You're, as we've said it many times now, but it's really important. Do not give... Austin Martin, any chances to bring anyone home beside himself. It'll be Julian Infante, the big first baseman, 0 for 1 with a strikeout today. That strikeout came in the second. We're here in the fifth, the first pitch to him this time. Fastball, blew it right by him for strike one. Yep, Tommy Henry still looking for his first K since the second inning, but you know, he had three strikeouts in the inning, but still gave up two runs. I think he'll take no runs and no strikeouts any day of the week. Currently sitting on four hits, two runs, one earned. As Tommy Henry, no walks, four Ks. That's his line through four and a third, but he's only at 59 pitches. He fires number 60. Fastball just misses inside, ball one. Bit of a surprise to me is that one was very much a borderline pitch right there, but you, you know, had to keep painting the corners and see which ones will go your way. 
it's always a bit frustrating when you're watching on TV and they put up that batter's box. Always shows you how much guesswork really does go into it. Henry gets his sign, takes a breath as he always does, and a 1-1 pitch. Fastball called, strike two right at the knees on the outside part of the plate. And that outside part of the plate to righties, inside to lefties, seems to be open for business for home plate umpire Jeff Hendricks, but not the opposite side of the plate as much. At least from our vantage point up here. Yeah, we don't have the best vantage point for inside, outside, and being really able to see horizontal movement on pitches, but we can tell roughly where they are. One, two pitch is a breaking ball popped down the right field line. That'll get foul and out of play just below the second deck. The count is one and two still on Infante. As you have about six or seven fans peeking their heads over the second deck railing, trying to see where that ball landed. Everyone looking to take home a foul ball from the championship series here in Omaha. Michigan infield's pretty straight up aside from a little bit of a leftward shift on the left side of the infield. One, two, fastball misses high. Two and two remains the count. So probably look for Henry now after changing the eye level in Fonte to drop down a breaking ball low. Or perhaps that change up that he really found after about the third inning of his Florida State start. Seemed to have it a little bit early on here. Chris Fetter calling the pitches. Made note of that to us when we talked to him earlier in the week. 2-2 two, two pitch. Call. Strike three. Got him with the change up right on the outside corner. Not agreeing with it is Infante. But Henry, as you said, gets his first strikeout on the second inning. His fifth strikeout overall. And there's two outs. Nobody on for Austin Martin. Yep, Infante checked his swing but ultimately was wrong. Should have gone all out for that one. Goes down looking. And there is Tommy Henry's first strikeout since the second. Number five on the day. And mission accomplished. Austin Martin is coming up to bat with none on. No chance of an RBI unless he goes yard. Certainly capable of doing so. He does have 10 home runs on the year and 23 other extra base hits. 19 doubles, 4 triples. There's a reason why he's so highly touted. And the first pitch to him this time is an off-speed pitch. A little two-hopper towards short. Jeff Glomgren feels on the backhand. Throws to first in time for out number three. A couple ground outs and a strikeout that inning. Set Vanderbilt down in order. We'll go to the top of the sixth inning. Michigan leads Vanderbilt by a score of 4-2. to two. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. A great 1-2-3 inning when you can get the first two before Martin. That's great, but get him down two. You're doing your job great there when you're Tommy Henry getting his first 1-2-3 since the first inning. as we'll have Christian Bullock leading off for Michigan to start the next inning, followed by Jack Blomgren and Joe Donovan. Donovan had a single earlier in this one, as well as teammate Jack Blomgren. Christian Bullock got his first hit of the College World Series on Friday versus Texas Tech. Started 0 for 7, but might have found his groove earlier. We'll see what he has to do with his, with his third time up to bat. And Michigan is getting close to appearance number four for Jordan Wogu and the rest of the top of the lineup. As Drake Fellows resumes his duties on the mound, you'd have to think, unless he has another really good inning like the third or the fifth, he will be done after this one. Michigan want to try to, the blueprint I'm sure is to get rid of him before this one's over even. Yeah, I think after this one, he's definitely done, if not during this sixth inning. He's at 98 pitches coming into it. The first two guys leading off this inning, Blomgren and Donovan, have both gotten on base in their two times at the plate. Uh, back in the second, it was two walks to lead off the inning, and the fourth, it was two singles to lead off the inning. We'll see if they can continue that trend, or if maybe Fellow's third time through the order will finally be able to retire those two. Yep, as Akeo Thomas is the man do up next? Could anyone get on base and stay there? Well, he my had mistake there. It is Christian Bullock leading things off. Yes, yeah. It's Chris, it's, uh, yeah, Christian Bullock due to lead things up third time coming up to the plate. Uh, Akeo Thomas, though, has been the hot bat, I guess, so far for Michigan with the one single as well as a successful bunt, putting runners in scoring positions who ultimately got stranded. It's a lesson and always double-checking your scorecard here. <laughs> Christian Bullock's going to lead things off. He Fouls the first pitch down the first base line, fielded by Nick Schnabel over there, former Michigan shortstop turned first base coach. And displaying the soft hands yet again there. 
Another he, great ground ball right in the gut right there. He was one of the best defensive shortstops I've ever seen in person. As an 0-1 pitch to Bullock off speed, misses outside, one and wants to count. He was making the plays that we see from a guy like Jack Blomgren, these barehanded plays over the middle. Berdar was doing that at a normal, everyday basis, perhaps. A predecessor to Jack Blomgren. I want to know how much perhaps Blomgren learned from Berdar. As a swing and a miss here, a breaking ball moving down and in on Christian Bullock. Brings the count to one and two. We'll see what Bullock can do here. He has two triples on the season, of course. This is a triple hitter's ballpark. And the last one, you'll probably remember, was that fourth run in the Los Angeles Super Regional in game three. One, two, pitch, call, strike three. Painted the fastball right at the knees. And that's the seventh strikeout for Drake Fellows in this one. His third on the last four batters. And it'll be Jack Blom right up with nobody on and one out in the inning. And that's his College World Series high, recorded six in part of a one-run performance versus Louisville. However, that comes at the cost of getting into the triple digits now. Pitch number 102, that was, that struck out Bullock, so we'll see how much longer he can last. I'm sure the game plan for Vandy is just to get out of this one. First pitch to Jack Blomgren, a little chopper near the left side. Austin Martin's going to try to run in and make the play. He will not be able to field it. That should be the second straight infield single for Jack Blomgren, a little chopper over towards Austin Martin. The first one he was able to field moving towards the shortstop and just couldn't get a grip on the throw. This one couldn't even corral it. We'll see what the official score is, but pretty confident that one's going to be another infield single. So Austin Martin and Blake Nelson both not having great games fielding over at third base, but they also both have hits, so they'll they'll uh, good with the bad. But there you go. I mean, one of the keys to beating Vanderbilt, maybe get in on Austin Martin's head defensively, and you know that might come in dividends offensively. He, of course, was the last out when Vandy was last due up, so getting to the head of a great player. Still no official score yet on that one. It is rule a hit. Jack Blomgren as a pickoff throw chases him back to the first base. Joe Donovan, the hitter. As you mentioned, Joe Donovan has followed up Jack Blomgren the first two times they come to the plate. When Blomgren walked in the second, Donovan walked after him. When Blomgren had an infield single in the fourth, Donovan snuck a ground ball through the left side in the fourth as well. And Drake Fellows allowed seven hits in each of his last two outings. I'm sure Vandy would love it if uh, that remained the case in this one, sitting at seven hits allowed right now. Gave up seven hits to, to Louisville, only allowed one run, though. That's uh, He did, that was through a full seven innings pitched. Right now, he's only through five and a third. First pitch, Donovan is a swing and a miss. It's 0-1 on the catcher for the Wolverines. And Joe Donovan, who does have the lowest batting average, I guess he's had the best day batting for Michigan uh, with the walk and the single. He's uh, been getting on base, hasn't done anything wrong yet. We'll see if his good day can continue. Did have that one pass ball defensively. Well, I'm going to short or lead over there at first base. Don't expect him to be running yet in this at-bat as a pickoff throw kept breaks him down to his knees, diving back in. Again, Blomgren's not getting a big enough lead where he has to dive all out on his stomach back. Keeps coming back down on his knees, right where the stirrups meet the pants. Getting those off-white uniforms a little more off-white with his infield dirt. <laughs> Fellows come set. 0-1 pitch. Donovan misses way outside. The count's 1-1. One one. Almost getting past the catcher there, Clark, but a nice stop. Keeps Blomgren at first base. And the fans are mad about something. That sounded like more than just one fan base being upset. I think the ball might have been tossed out of play or something. I'm not, oh, now we're getting the cheer. I don't see where everybody's looking or what everybody's looking at exactly. We'll investigate later on. The wave is going in the back. 1-1 one, one pitch, swing and a miss. Got him, pulled the string on him there. The wave Did has... Fellows, one and two. The wave has gone slow motion in the outfield. Maybe that was what got the crowd going. I'm not entirely sure, but... Fans having some fun here. A lot of neutral fans in the house, although I think they might be tilted Michigan if they are indeed Husker fans rooting for the Big Ten. Well, I'm runs over there on first base, watching the 1-2 pitch to Donovan. Misses high with the fastball. Rather, tried to bring that breaking ball. It just didn't break. No, it not at two all. And two. Yeah, you're not going to fool anyone with a pitch like that. Fellows wants a new ball after that one, and perhaps reasonably <laughs> so. Yep, out with the old and with the new when you have one like that. Even if it's just a mental thing for a pitcher, pitchers are can be quirky out there at times. And there'll be pitchers that'll tell you that themselves, especially left-handers. 
quirky lefties. 2-2 pitch to Donovan. Bounce in the dirt. Gets a little bit away from the catcher, Clark. Donovan, or rather, Blomgren tries to get to second. It's overthrown over there. Blomgren would have been safe anyway. A nice backup by the shortstop, Paul. Or else that one could have gotten into center field. Blomgren would have maybe had a shot to go to third. Yep, I think ultimately that one was a bit too shallow and not thrown hard enough to allow Blomgren to advance to third. But you never know. Uh, Blomgren could have had the chance to go there. And, of course, Michigan is being very aggressive with the bases. That one didn't get terribly far away from Clark, but Blomgren had a really good secondary lead. Got a good jump as soon as he saw that ball start to trickle away from Clark and got to second, sliding in head first, right near that broken finger of his that's covered up on his left hand. And Donovan's got a 3-2 count. The pitch. This one poked off the end of the bat towards right center field. Going over is the, the center fielder, DeMarco. He makes the grab in shallow right center. So Blomgren will retreat back to second, and there's two outs and a runner on second. And, of course... Out there at center field, he did have that great throw to beat Jordan Wogu to third base earlier in the game. Blomgren doesn't even think about the idea of tagging up, just stands 10 feet off second base, waiting to see if that one lands before trying to go to third. Ultimately has to go back to second, but that does put a runner in scoring position thanks to the wild pitch. And now Akeo Thomas can maybe drive one home, get his first RBI of the day. First pitch to Akeo Thomas, bounces in the dirt. It's 1-0 on him. Michigan leads Vanderbilt by a score of 4-2 here with two outs in the top of the sixth inning. We're in game one of a three-game, or rather best of three, set to determine the national champions for college baseball here in 2019. Blomgren a short lead out there at second with Ray standing just a couple feet away from the second base bag. Here we trying to keep that lead as short as possible, so perhaps a single from Akeo Thomas wouldn't necessarily score Blomgren automatically. 1-0 pitch misses inside as Thomas moves his hands up and out of the way. Of course, you really don't want to walk Akeo Thomas. Not only do you put another runner on base, but that sets up the scariest leadoff hitter in college baseball. Maybe not even in this game, but that's, what we're, but that's been his nickname all year round. Don't want him up to the bat with two on. Taking a step off is Fellows now, perhaps trying to regroup after the 2-0 pitch. Or rather before the 2-0 pitch, after he fell down in the count 2-0. He's going to come set at the chest again. 2-0 pitch to Akeo Thomas, misses low and away, ball three. Well, hitters count, that's for sure right now. Akeo Thomas probably just going to let this one go no matter what Fellows throws, unless he really puts one in the breadbasket. We'll see what he does here. Michigan not really looking to get runners on base right now with the runner in scoring position and two out. They're looking to send one into the outfield. Thomas leans back in that right-handed batter's box. We'll see if he's swinging here on 3-0 and gets the green light from Backage. Wouldn't be surprised here for a senior in a huge moment. Easily the biggest stage that the, any of these seniors have played on in their Michigan career. Hey, Thomas getting a big hit here would certainly be a memorable moment for him in this program. Already driven in one today. 3-0 pitch, taking all the way. It's strike one with the fastball. So there you have it. Uh, K.O. Thomas definitely, I don't think, was planning on swinging at anything. 4-2 uh, right now here in the top of the sixth. Michigan leads. Righty to righty. The tall 6-5 fellows to the 5-7 K.O. Thomas. 3-1 pitch, misses high with the fastball, ball four. So Akeo Thomas continues his solid day. Had the single to start the game and then the sacrifice bunt to put runners on second and third. Ultimately, no one scored, but Akeo Thomas did his part. Gets on base here. Not exactly what Michigan needs, but when you get Jordan Wogu up to the bat for the fourth time in a game, as it looks like Drake Fellows' day is going to be done through six and two-thirds. So does not quite get to seven like he did against Louisville. Five and two thirds, excuse me. Uh, losing track of what inning it is. So Jordan Wogu going to get a fresh arm to deal with, but that's all right. He has gotten on base to lead off the game twice out of four opportunities here in Omaha. So no stranger to getting contact on a lead on a leadoff pitcher. Well, he walked to start this one, but. I'm Michigan will be fine with that. Have the bases loaded for a guy who's hit a home run already here in Omaha on the second pitch of that game versus Florida State all the way back a week ago on Monday. So Tim Corbin has seen enough from Fellows after he goes deep into a pitch count but not very deep into the ball game. As you mentioned, it's five and two-thirds. His line not shut quite yet as he's responsible for both the runners 
on first and second in this inning with two outs. But he He'll will turn to the even taller left-hander, Zach King, 6'6", 212 junior out of Spring Hill, Tennessee. King has appeared in 21 ball games this year, started three times, also has three saves on the year. 0-2 with a 5.92 ERA, 38 innings pitched, 44 walks, 22 strikeouts. Batters hit 266 against the big left-hander. So if there was ever a time to get your first win, it would be in the College World Series finale as uh, Fellows is going to go back to the dugout with seven hits in each of his last three games. Uh, very different run totals, though. Giving up seven, five earned against Duke in that 18-5 loss. One run, one earned against Louisville. And four runs, four earned here against Michigan. At least thus far, as you said. Yes. He's still responsible yeah. for two runners on base. Yep, could end up with six earned runs on the day. Michigan would certainly like to be that like for that to be the case, leading by two runs here in the top of the sixth inning. Would like to make it a 6-2 score if they possibly can drive in those two runners on base. At least 5-2, I'm sure they take if Wogu can find some grass in the outfield and drive in the runner at second Blomgren. And as we mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Drake Fellows entered the NCAA postseason 12-0, leading the NCAA in wins conceded that first loss to Duke before picking up his 13th win on the year versus Louisville. Ultimately now, though, he is in danger of loss number two, and Michigan has been doing that to teams on this postseason run. UCLA had not lost a ser series all season long. That's how you get to be the number one seed in the NCAA tournament before dropping two or three when it mattered the most against Michigan. Lost three of four on the season as they dropped one to Michigan back in Los Angeles in March, a 7-5 to five defeat. Michigan, though, has not faced Vanderbilt since way back in 2007, and uh, that was a pretty significant one, too, meaning in the NCAA postseason where they won the National Regional to go to their first Super Regional in program history, way back when, when pitching coach Chris Fetter was a, just a pitcher for the Wolverines. Yeah, pitcher for the Wolverines, the... Leader in innings pitched here at the University of Michigan is Chris Fetter. Loves the university. It's the reason he came back after a major league offers. First pitch to Jordan Wogu. Here's a fastball high, ball one. So Jordan Wogu, who saw a 3 nothing count when he first came up to bat against Drake Fellows to start this game, now ahead with a new pitcher. King, the big lefty to the big right-hander, Jordan Wogu. Comes set, checks... The runners at second base, that's Jack Blomgren, and fires a breaking ball. It misses way low and away. Count is 2-0, and and a huge difference there on the radar gun. We know it's probably a couple ticks low, but the difference there, 17 miles an hour between his first pitch, the fastball, and that breaking ball. 91-74 to 74 is what it read here, probably a couple ticks higher in all reality. Yep, that's an impressive breaking ball, however. Does not get Wogu if that one is low. 2-0 pitch. Tries off speed again, but it misses low. Or they hit, what was the fastball there? He tried this fastball, couldn't get it to stay on the knees. And the count is 3-0. and And there you have it, 3-0 count. Now, you wonder if Jordan Wogu, such a great hitter, is going to have the green light here. Or maybe just stare at one, try to dare King to load the bases. I'd give Wogu the green light on a fastball down the middle and pretty much nothing else. We'll see what head coach Eric Backish does. 3-0 pitch. He does get a fastball. It is called strike one. Yep, that went a little bit low for Wogu's comfort, it looks like. But, uh, yeah, I, I I think in any situation, let Wogu hit a fastball down the middle. Uh, that tends to be bad news for the pitcher. Vanderbilt playing Wogu a bit to pull, but not very much. Pretty straight up as he swings and misses at a fastball on 3-1. It's full 3-2. and two. The runners will be on the move here with two outs. And, th yep, there you have it. Quickly, Zach King gets back ahead in this pitch, uh, pitch and count. 3-2, though, Wogu had a pretty long battle with Fellows earlier in this game in his last at bat. We'll see what he does here. Walking two ground outs so far. He gets a 3-2 count here. The pitch. Fastball. Call. Strike three. Wogu thought he had a walk on a one that missed inside, but he was rung up by Jeff Hendricks. One batter, one strikeout for King, and he gets Vanderbilt out of the inning without any damage done. We'll head to the bottom of the sixth inning. Michigan leads the Commodores by a score of 4-2. to two. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast from Michigan Baseball here on WCBN Sports. I'm Austin Falco, Daniel Thompson alongside me for your call today and for the rest of this series. Michigan stranding runners on the bases again with a runner in scoring position, can't score. 
that's that might come back to haunt them. They got a four nothing in this one. Have conceded two runs since, and you get the feeling four probably isn't going to be enough. Now Jeff Criswell is yet to start. Usually Michigan Saturday starter has been dealing in relief for Carl Kaufman in his first two appearances in Omaha. We get the feeling from head coach Eric Bakich, who described it as saying, we're going to play every game like it's the last game of the season, not going to worry about tomorrow. Fighting is likely. I mean, Michigan was up by, I think, on Friday. But really good there. Yeah, faced the minimum nine batters. Had six strikeouts and a double play ball thrown in there. I think his other out was a weak pop-out, if I'm remembering correctly. The Michigan pitchers do walk down to the bullpen a bit, including the likes of, I can see, Joe Pace and Blake Beers. I'm sure Ben Kaiser, Isaiah Page, some of the bigger names down there. Tommy Henry's going to start the six with a 4-2 lead, sitting on 65 pitches. Some He's fans getting three T-shirts here as they're releasing them into the crowd. Uh, He's going to face the two, three, and four hitters here in the sixth inning, Blade, Paul, and Clark, who have... Yet to have a ton of success against Henry in this ball game. Henry's done a very good job against the top of the order. Has given up a couple base runners, starting with Clark on down. But for the most part, an efficient outing for Tommy Henry through five, at least. Lede is 0 for 2. The number four overall pick in this past year's draft is grounded out weakly to first base and popped up behind the plate to Joe Donovan. Lefty to lefty here. Henry looking to continue having Bladé's number on the day. First pitch. Fastball is at high and deep towards right field. This one's back and gone. No doubter for J.J. Bladé. Finds the first row above the bullpen in right field. And it's 4-3. The Commodores cut the Michigan lead in half yet again. It makes every last foot of that one count. Rather than drop one in the bullpen, sends a fan home with a souvenir as he really got a piece of that one. There was never much doubt. Jordan Brewer took one look at it and just slowly trotted toward the wall watching that one go. That's home run number 27 on the year for J.J. Blue Day. There's a reason he was number four overall pick. He showed it right there. Gets a first pitch fastball from Tommy Henry. Middle right around at the thighs. Tommy Henry knew it as soon as he hit it. So did Blue Day. And it's 4-3, just a one-run ball game here. That'll bring up Ethan Paul. Got nine home runs on the season for him. Henry winds up the first pitch to Paul. Off speed this time, catches the outside corner, strike one. And you knew Michigan was going to have to keep up that pace. They have gone silent for a while now. Four scoreless innings, not without threatening to score. But they're going to have to punch in another run, I think, to win this game. Henry winds up an 0-1 pitch here to Paul as a line drive. One hopper to Okeo Thomas, makes a nice play down to a knee and throws to first in time to make the out. Another hard to hit ball there from the three hitter of Vanderbilt. One out, nobody on for Philip Clark. And Thomas has just been phenomenal defensively all College Road Series long. Had a couple of hiccups on the road to Omaha, but he has gotten here and gotten comfortable stopping a hard hit ball from entering the outfield as he's done several times now in Omaha, Philip Clark due up, as we mentioned last time, through the order. 21-year-old sophomore is draft eligible and was selected not in the ninth round by the Toronto Blue Jays. After giving up a homer to the fourth overall pick, Tommy Henry can get some redemption against an mlb -er. First pitch here, off speed, called, strike one. Clark does have some power in his bat as well. Eight home runs on the year, 17 other extra base hits. Pretty speedy for a catcher with four triples on the year. Would certainly like to at least get himself into scoring position here, representing the tying run as Vanderbilt trails by one in the sixth. He pops one up towards the left side. That'll get out of play beyond the third base bag and into the second deck. The count is 0-2. As the fans kind of let out a disappointing groan, a couple of different fans up there in the second deck had a chance to get that one. Ultimately plays a game of Plinko and drops down to the lower stands. Henry looks to be in control here after the leadoff home run. Took two pitches to retire Paul. Now the 0-2 pitch to Clark. Goes for the high fastball. Clark doesn't chase. It's 1-2. and two. And that was pitch 71 for Henry. So he is managing the load pretty well. You think he probably, Michigan is going to hope at least he's got a couple more innings left in him before likely Chriswell comes in for relief. 
And he puts that glove in front of his face once he gets the sign he likes and now winds up for a 1-2 pitch. This one is hit high in the air down the right field line. Jordan Brewer's giving chase over near the wall over there. He's going to make a grab in front of the warning track in the right field corner for out number two. And that was a dangerous place for that ball to go. However, took way too long to get there. Jordan Brewer had all the time to get under it. Overran it just a bit to begin. Maybe makes Michigan fans a bit nervous here, but ultimately corrects it and it gets to the out. So none on, two out, but not before the damage has been done. One run homer for Vanderbilt to make this a 4-3 ball game. J.J. Blade. Pat DeMarco is going to step up here. DeMarco strikeout and hit by pitch thus far against Henry. First pitch to him this time, lefty, righty. Gets it off the end of the bat and hits a two-hopper to shortstop. Jack Blomman goes in the hole, tries to make the throw, but pulls Jimmy Kerr off the bag. It gets past Kerr, but DeMarco's going to stay at first base. A rare throwing error there on Jack Blomgren allows a two-out runner to reach base in the sixth. And now the tying run is on first base. Steven Scott, with some power in his bat, is due up next. And there you have it. Not only, even if Michigan escapes the inning without doing any more damage, Tommy Henry could have been out of that inning really quickly, even though we gave up a run. Could have at least helped extend his game longer with that. Now he's going to have a bit more work to do, as it does feel like batters are getting a bit more of his pitches right now. He's able to get that one off the end of the bat of DeMarco, but at Blomgren just threw it wide off to his arm side and down the first baseline near home plate. So Henry had to deal with the runner on. Steven Scott fouls the first pitch. No, he swings and misses at a first pitch that gets past Donovan. And the runners can move up to second. Tying run in scoring position. Vanderbilt trailing 4-3 here in the bottom of the six to the Wolverines. And Michigan, they were that close to getting out of the inning. Routine ground ball. And now this might really be one that comes back to haunt them. We've talked about it. A couple errors in this game. Officially none on the... Or well, the one on that goes down is the first error on the score sheet, but... That passed ball, Jordan Wogu trying to advance to third. Another passed ball there on Joe Donovan, I assume. We haven't gotten the official score yet, but looked very clearly like a passed ball to me. And the Big Ten leader in passed balls had a couple today. Hoping this one doesn't cost the Wolverines too much. As this one's going to bounce way in front of the plate, and the runner's going to move to third. That'll be a wild pitch, and the count's going to be one and one on Scott with two outs. And you can really feel things maybe unraveling right now for Michigan. This will be a huge one to get out of and avoid a crisis as there is a runner who has not really earned his way to third at all. Made contact, gave himself a chance, and has been rewarded with a free trip to third practically. The one that moved Donovan, to, or that moved the runner, DeMarco, to second, officially ruled a wild pitch there, so Donovan gets off the hook for that. That one most certainly a wild pitch, and that'll warrant a visit from Chris Fetter out to the mound. Chris Fetter not wearing the sweatshirt like we saw earlier in the season and in the NCAA tournament. He's in full uniform here, stirrups and all. The 6'8 pitching coach towers above everybody when he's standing right on top of the mound, giving instruction to his pitcher Henry, his catcher Donovan, and the rest of the infield. And there you have it, just two pitches into this at bat. You see the base runner advance to right there. So Pat DeMarco getting on all the way to third. Just two pitches into the set bat, so the goal here for Michigan might just be safely deliver this ball to Joe Donovan's hands. Michigan leads 4-3 here in the bottom of the sixth, but the tying run is on third base with Steven Scott up to bat. Scott, overall near 35 extra base hits, 59 RBIs, needs one more right here. He fouls one off to the left side. That's giving chase is Blake Nelson over near the camera wall. Didn't think he had a shot at it at first. He does not have a shot at it. It bounces off the camera well. The count's now one and two. Good hustle play nonetheless, trying to bail this pitcher out of a sticky situation. Michigan one strike away from avoiding a total crisis and forcing a completely unearned run to tie the ball game up. Yeah, the inning certainly not going the way Michigan wanted. The leadoff home run and then, as you mentioned, error and two wild pitches to advance the tying run to third base. Yep, and that was Michigan's first error of the whole College World Series. Played really great defense up into, to this point. Almost no complaints you could have had. No one even close to holding the runner at third base. As Henry fires a 1-2 pitch, this one's way in front of it and fouls it towards the camera well on the right side this time. The count's going to remain 1-2 and two on Scott. Yep, got a couple of cameramen to try to duck away from that one. It's had a chance of hopping into the bullpen and maybe breaking some very expensive equipment but it might do even more damage here if he can find the outfield and tie this ball game up. Steven Scott also has 14 home runs, so it's not out of the question that he 
gives Vandy the lead with one swing to the bat. Henry lefty to lefty, coming set. Big pitch here on one two. Breaking ball in the dirt. Donovan blocks this one, eats it up, and swallows it right into his gut. Counts two and two. And probably made a few thousand Michigan fans here in the stadium have their hearts to the beat right there as they saw that ball in the dirt. Tommy Henry trying to come up big here at the College World Series yet again for the Wolverines. The junior looks in for the sign from his sophomore catcher. Comes set at the stomach. 2-2. Two -two. Swing and a miss, strike three. Big strikeout with the slider there. Tommy Henry gets what is his sixth strikeout of the day. None more important than that one. And we'll head to the seventh inning. Michigan leading Vanderbilt by a score of 4-3. to three. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast of Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. And Michigan holds on to the lead there. They have not played defense without a lead all game long. They will take the field with their narrowest margin of victory all season. All game long unless Michigan tacks on some more runs here. They will have more of the back end of the Vanderbilt lineup to deal with if they can get there. I do expect Tommy Henry to return for the next inning, but Jeff Criswell is going to have a long leash to work with or rather maybe Tommy Henry has the short leash as Eric Backage will gladly go to Jeff Criswell who has been just about perfect so far in Omaha in relief. He will but you'd have to think he wants to be able to reserve as much of Jeff Criswell as he can for tomorrow's game. Maybe ride Henry until that ninth inning if all goes well before bringing in Criswell. And we'll visit the pitching in the bottom half of the inning, but we're gonna head to the top of the seventh here, Michigan leading 4-3. They'll have the heart of the order, two, three, and four, try and attack on some insurance, Franklin, Brewer, and Kerr against the big left-hander, Zach King, who's still in the ball game, having only thrown six pitches, a six-pitch strikeout to Jordan Wogu. Finished off the sixth inning in a really tight spot for Vanderbilt, really kind of turned the tide. Vanderbilt got those runs early on in the ball game, but from then on, Michigan still seemed in control, leading 4-2 for a while. And in that sixth inning, Michigan got a couple runners on with two outs. A big strikeout, got Wogu, and then Vanderbilt immediately with a leadoff home run on the first pitch at the bottom of the sixth. Needed a one-run ball game. After the error with two outs in the bottom of the sixth, it felt like the tide might have been turning before the big strikeout from Tommy Henry. Yep, so the pressure never really on the Michigan batteries until, in, until just now, just like this. They have gone cold for the last four innings. A chance to break the the streak they've been on after scoring twice in the first two, have had runners in scoring position, have not been able to bring anyone home. Jesse Franklin, who's had quite a great past two games here in Omaha, homering versus Florida State before being one of many runners to do big things against Texas Tech in their second time up. This King's gonna work out of the windup now, the tall, lanky left-hander against the left-hander Franklin. The big windup, first pitch fastball, swung on and missed by Franklin on the high one. And it's 0-1. Franklin led the Big Ten with walks, and he's already has 50 on the season. Doesn't want to get behind in account. Would be big if Michigan can get yet another leadoff hitter on. Big wind up again in the 0-1 to Franklin. Another fastball. This one strike two on the outside edge. He grounded out twice after getting that single to in his second at bat of the game, second at bat of the whole game. A single back in the first, hard hit through the right, or rather up the middle. Came around to score the runs first, of the ball game's first run. As a 1-1 pitch misses way outside, or rather 0-2 pitch misses way outside, it's 1-2 and two now. And you can't help but think how this could be a 5-3 ball game. Had Jordan Wogu not gone for it, the aggressive base running yet to pay off for Michigan. Long wind up again, 1-2 pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. Pulled the string on him with the 76 mile an hour breaking ball. That's the second strikeout for King and as many batters that he's faced in this ballgame. I'll bring up Jordan Brewer. Michigan yet to score without a leadoff base runner, but neither has Vanderbilt. Jordan Brewer, of course, had that double that brought Franklin home, which should have really been a triple. Brewer on the day, one for three. Double in the first, then a line out to short and a strikeout. And a subsequent two at-bats takes the first pitch off speed off the outside corner. Counts 1-0 and on him. Yep, Brewer just 23 walks on the year. Not nearly as strong of an eye 
as Jesse Franklin, but he's been getting the job done with his bat. One, two. Check swings on a ball that missed low. And going around said first base umpire Perry Costello. Count's going to be one and one. Yeah, Michigan not able to take advantage of a, of a pass ball right there. Could it be a 2 no count, too. Uh, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if Jordan Brewer went around on that one, but Costello ringing him up anyway. So instead of being 2-0, it is 1-1 on the junior right fielder. This time he grounds one up the middle. It'll be the second baseman playing on the third base side of the bag. Ray throws to first in the dirt, it, not in time. Jordan Brewer beats it out. And there's that speed right there. Makes the most of it. Most batters cannot get there in that time. That was very bang-bang. I don't think they're reviewing that, although... Vanderbilt is pleading for it, although I do really think he is safe. No, he looks safe. Definitely looks safe yep. to me. Great hustle by Jordan Brewer. That should go down as an in another infield hit for the Wolverines. And it is a bang-bang play, so I really doubt the review could do much, but it does look like the umps are going to the camera well and are going to take another look at this one. I do not expect it to be overturned, but you never know. Right, we haven't gotten a slow-mo replay or anything, but it certainly looked like Brewer beat it out. A little nonchalant by Ray, backhanding the ball on the shortstop side a second. Took a couple hops to get a grip and then fired one low in the dirt. Nice scoop by Infante over at first base, but I think Jordan Brewer beat it. What do you got on the replay here, Dan? That's a lot closer than I first thought based off the replay. You heard the ooze from the crowd right there. Another angle right now, and I think he's out by the slimmest of margins, but I don't know if this is enough to overturn it. It's really where the cleats on the heel touch the bag, and yeah, I think he might be out by maybe a cleat length. Yep, if... If there was no ruling on the field there, there the ump never made a call, which of course you can't do, but in a world where there's no precedent to the call on the field, I would rule out, but I don't know if I can do that here with the call being safe on the field. Harrison Ray definitely let it be way too close. We'll see, though, if the umps give him a second chance. If I remember correctly, there was a stat that only one call has been overturned this entire College World Series via replay despite many of them going to replay. And well, it looks like the call is coming. Well, we get our second right here. The call, he is safe at first base. And okay. you hear a bit more claps than, uh, than boos right there. So I think that does confirm at least our theory from Friday that Michigan was going to have more people rooting for them. Maybe not more fans necessarily, but the people of Big Ten country here where we, I can look at Iowa from where we're sitting. So, uh, Real in the right in the heartland where a lot of people might be rooting for a Midwestern baseball team to uh, win a first college world series from a team in that region since all the way back in 1966. Ohio, uh, Ohio State winning Wichita State, the closest team to Omaha to win one recently in 19, well, not, not really recently, but all the way back in 89. Jimmy Kerr steps up, takes a hack at a first pitch fastball high, and it's 0 1 on him. Michigan leads 4 3 here in the top of the seventh inning, runner on first, one out. Big spot for Kerr, who's 0 for 3 today. Two strikeouts and a flyout to left field. All three coming against the starter, Drake Fellows. Gets his first look at a tough lefty, Zach King. Yep, what a time it would be to come alive for the guy who I think is right now the MVP of this College World Series. Big off throw, chases Brewer back. He's in standing after a couple of steps. Didn't have a huge lead, especially against the big, lanky left-hander. Brewer is a threat to steal at any given time. He leads the Michigan in stolen bases, 25 for 29 on the year. And an aggressive team, that's quite the feat to lead the team in stolen bags. He hops a little bit over at first base as a 0-1 pitch catches the outside corner of Jimmy Kerr, and it's 0-2. Yep, you paid dearly for that aggressive base running strategy in the top of the first. I think it's the time to live or die by it. Maybe send Brewer here with two strikes. Of course, you're in danger of the strike mount throw on double play, but here with two strikes, would not be surprised to see that really slow breaking ball maybe get Brewer a couple extra seconds to get there's a couple extra split seconds to get to second base. Pick off throw gets him back in standing. Yep, he has not taken much of a lead off here. Heel on the bag as we speak right now. Vanderbilt is playing Jimmy Kerr to pull. Three infielders on the second base side of the second base bag. Just Austin Martin left near the shortstop position on the left side. Breaking ball, Jimmy Kerr hits one high and deep down the right field line. This one's going back near the wall. That ball is gone! Jimmy Kerr, two-run home run, Michigan lead 6-3. And as you said, maybe the MVP of this College World Series thus far comes through once again. No doubt right there as he hits the first two-run homer for a while in this College World Series. Didn't see any 
home runs from other than Jimmy Kerr back on Friday when these two teams last played. He does it again, and I think Jesse Franklin's okay with this one. Mentioning in the press conference on Friday, he was a bit upset that Jimmy Kerr overtook him for the season-long home run leader. That's number 15 on the year for number 15, Jimmy Kerr. As Jordan Brewer knew that one was gone the whole way, never left first base, was waiting for Kerr to get to first base, steering back at the base. Gave him two fist pumps. It was a great teammate moment right there for two guys who have been drafted are going to be leaving this program at the end of the season. That's Blake Nelson up to bat now. He lines one in the center field. That's going to be a base hit for him as well. The Michigan crowd has come alive here in Omaha. And Blake Nelson getting involved in this game for the first time really since his single in the top of the first. And you can really feel things maybe got cracked open there. Michigan playing with a lot more comfort right now. And you really don't want to be down three with three innings to go with your Vanderbilt against a bullpen where Jeff Criswell is probably going to be the reliever. And Tommy Henry still has about 20 pitches left in his arm. Yeah, I only see two guys in Michigan jerseys down the bullpen. And one of them is the big frame of Jeff Criswell. Yep, uh, Zach. I presume he's the guy after Henry. But Henry still got a little bit of life left in him come the bottom half of this inning. Especially now with a three-run lead here in the seventh inning. Yep, Zach King makes everyone look small, uh, standing at 6'6", six, six he does, but the 6'4", Jeff Crizzle, will be the third tallest pitcher to enter this game, thanks to uh, Drake Fellow standing at 6'5". Tall pitching staff for Vanderbilt. After a brief meeting between Clark and King on the mound, Christian Bullock's going to step in. Tough lefty-lefty matchup for him now, although it didn't seem to matter for Kerr, but a high fastball swung on and missed that by Christian Bullock. He was trying to answer Kerr's two-run home run with one of his own. And it's 0-1 on the Michigan left fielder. Well, Jimmy Kerr came to life at exactly the right time with his 15th homer on the year. Might be the time for Christian Bullock now to really split this thing open, maybe give Michigan a grand slam lead. Second pitch, the at-bats, another fastball. That's on the outside part, 0-2, starting off the exact same way as the Jimmy Kerr at-bat started off. High fastball swung on and missed, followed by the fastball on the outside part of the plate. The next pitch from Jimmy Kerr, or to Jimmy Kerr, was sent into the right field bullpen. The 0-2 pitch to Christian Bullock as a fastball misses high and away. You know he wasn't going to give himself a, give a breaking ball over the heart of the plate there was Zach King after what he did last time. Still one out with one on first, 6-3 here in the top of the seventh inning. Already two runs on the board for Michigan. Coming set is King. He's going to throw over to first and keep Blake Nelson honest over there. Nelson 15 for 15 this season on stolen bases. You don't necessarily expect him to go. He doesn't have the blazing speed, and there is the big strikeout threat in Christian Bullock at the plate. It's been his one Achilles heel. He's got the speed, got some pop, can hit the ball hard, but does have a propensity to strike out. He's got two already today. And a throw over, it's going to keep Blake Nelson close again. Yep, I talked to him yesterday in the dugout. He mentioned how he uh, really thanks his pitching coach for getting him going yesterday, or back on Friday, after an 0-7 start here in Omaha. They got on base four times on Friday, three walks and a single through the right side. With a runner on first here and a 1-2 count, Nelson is going, swinging a miss, the strike three. Nelson gets the second base, the throw gets into the outfield. Nelson can move up to third. And there you go, force Vanderbilt to make a mistake. And for the first time all game, that aggressive base running strategy pays off. Uh, I think Michigan is really glad they did not send Jordan Brewer with Jimmy Kerr up to the bag <laughs> and rob themselves of a run. But... Not, not sure it really would have mattered at that point. 0-2 if they had... Sure, yeah. Sent him. Jimmy Kerr puts it into the bullpen anyway. Just what Jordan Brewer just would have had to wait longer for Jimmy Kerr to yeah, catch yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, a little bit longer. But I meant earlier in the at-bat. Uh, <laughs> could have maybe something gone wrong there. But here it pays off. We'll see if Michigan can cash it in, though. Two outs. The sacrifice is out of play. But Jack Baumgren, a guy who's been hitting well, a 310 hitter on the year, walked and has two singles in this game. Both singles have not left the infield. He swings and misses at a first-pitch fastball here. It's 0-1 on him. Michigan with a three-run lead here in the top of the seventh. Two gone, runner on third with a chance to extend it. Blomgren, as you mentioned, walk in the second, two singles since then. Neither have left the infield. Austin Martin unable to make a play on either. One not even make a throw. Second time not able to feel. This is a ground ball towards shortstop. Gobbled up by Paul. He throws to first in plenty of time to retire Blomgren. But a big two-run home run here in the top of the seventh by Jimmy Kerr. Extends the Michigan lead to three. Headed... To the bottom of the seventh, we're hitting the seventh inning stretch. Michigan leads Vanderbilt by a score of 6-3. to three. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast of Michigan Baseball.
2019 NCAA Men's Baseball Champions. Yep, and we saw back in the bottom of that sixth inning, J.J. Bledy hits the home run and gets to the out-of-the-park action going here in the championship series in Omaha, the fourth overall pick, but he gets he gets upstaged by the 33rd rounder in Jimmy Kerr. Trying to find the exact number he was in the draft, but you don't have to be the star of the show to, to take the stage here in Omaha. I do think Jimmy Kerr is going to have a pretty good chance to get himself into at least maybe a triple-A situation, major, majors one day, despite being a 33rd round pick, because he has really gotten better here in his senior year. I think if he batted like that all throughout his career at Michigan, he'd be more of a, maybe even a day one type guy. Might be a guy at least who gets in the top 10 and gets that higher signing bonus before they all flatten out and reach the same rate. But the, 40, the fourth overall pick is outdone by the 33rd overall pick. I mean, both of them went yard to the right field, and Kerr was just fortunate he had a guy on base, but he steals the show. His team has stolen the show as they've scored two runs in three separate innings to score all six. Six to three, Michigan. Vandy's done it with a two-run bottom of the second and then that solo home run that we were just talking about from J.J. Blede. Great start to really warm up the action as we enter the home stretch. Michigan will be up to bat two more times at the very least, and they're hoping to keep Vanderbilt to just, just two more at bats. Tommy Henry recaptures the mound. Well, Vanderbilt will get three no matter yes, what. Yes, yes, sorry. They're, they're for, the home team. You keep getting that switched up this week. You're home and away here with the count number uh, of bats. You know, the, to the home runs really just got my <laughs> mind focused on offense. Uh, mind a bit too racing there. Couldn't quite get it all under control. Tommy Henry still on the mound here at the bottom of the seventh with a three-run lead for the Wolverines. He'll get the bottom of the Vanderbilt lineup, Ray, Duval, and Infante. Third time through the order here for Vanderbilt. Ray's going to square on to bunt and take a first pitch called strike. It's 0-1 on him. Same thing that happened in his at-bat in the fourth. Looked to lay down a bunt for a hit and pulled back and took an off-speed pitch. He's one for two with a single and a ground out to third. Right down the line to Blake Nelson, where Nelson is positioned right now. An off-speed pitch here on 0-1, and Ray was way out in front of it, doesn't bother swinging, and it's 0-2 on him. And, of course, Harrison Ray did have a little bit of trouble with that ground ball, threw it a bit too softly, and that allowed the speedy Jordan Brewer to get to first and represent one of those two runs on that Jimmy Kerr homer. He's got to be looking for redemption right now. 0-2 pitch. Fastball misses low and away. That's ball one. Henry Mitt, perhaps going for a chase pitch here, making Ray think it was that slider and was going to break back towards the outside corner, get him to chase at it, but Ray did not. The junior right-handed hitter stands in there, waggles that bat a little bit, and the 1-2 from Henry. This one's off the end of the bat towards third. Blake Nelson gobbles it up, throws to first in plenty of time for out number one. And have, after having a couple of hiccups, none were airs, but difficult ground balls that he could have maybe cashed in for an out. Blake Nelson makes a difficult play, galloping side to side to ground that one before delivering a not perfect, but got the job done throw to Jimmy Kerr to retire the first one here as Michigan has a lot of leeway to play now, up three runs as they're getting through the bottom of the Vandy lineup, hoping to not have to see these guys again, Ty Duvall. Now, yeah, every Vandy batter for right now doesn't know if it will be their last to bat here in game one. They certainly will get another chance, though, tomorrow. Ty Duvall steps in, takes a first pitch, and fouls it off to the left side over the Vanderbilt dugout. 0-1 on the designated hitter for Vanderbilt. He's one for two on the day. RBI single in the second. Ground out to short in the fifth. And a really impressive one-handed snag to get that ball by, I think, a kid who looks like 12 or 13 in the crowd. Takes his hat off, takes a bow. Ah, no, that looks maybe more like a shorter adult from... I'm pretty far away. Can't really tell. Crowd deserved a bigger roar for that. 0-1 pitch. Fouls it off his foot. Here does Duvall, and the count's now 0-2. Henry trying to retire him on strikes perhaps the first time today. Henry's got six strikeouts on the day overall, including two of the men on deck, Julian Infante. If he can retire, Duval here has a great shot of getting out of this inning without having to go through the Vanderbilt lineup for the fourth time. Lefty to lefty. Henry gets the sign, takes a breath. The 0-2 delivery. Hit in the air towards left field. Christian Bullock stops in his tracks, now jogs in, and makes the play in shallow left for out number two in the bottom of the seventh inning. And I believe that's the first time Christian Bullock has gotten to get involved on defense in this game. 
really just the one fly ball out toward Tommy, uh, toward Jesse Franklin and the one fly ball that Jordan Brewer caught, and of course the one home run. Tommy Henry really doing a good job of limiting Vanderbilt to mostly soft contact, a lot of those rolling into the outfield, but has still only given up five hits while the Vanderbilt pitching staff has given up ten. So Julian Infante 0 for 2 with two strikeouts, one of each variety swinging and looking against Tommy Henry. Henry takes a breath. We'll see how he attacks him this time. It's a first pitch off speed. Just misses high. Ball one. Tommy Henry on his way to a quick inning. Only at pitch number 86. And I, you don't know if uh, we're going to see Zach King come out again in the next inning. But that could be an important thing to, here too. As if this series goes to three. Which teams will have the most available bullpen? Michigan not to use their has not yet used their bullpen at all in Omaha. 1-0 pitch. is swung on and missed. Another off speed that just dropped off the table to Infante. The count's one and one on him. Infante, the big first baseman, was heard from in the press conference that we had with both teams before the start of this series. A man of few words is the 6'3 senior out of Miami, Florida. Very complimentary of the Wolverine program as he swings and fouls one off back behind the plate. It's one and two on him. Pitch number 88 for Henry. He can get out of this one still under 90. That would give him a really good chance to finish up eight and maybe have Criswell. Although, I mean, I don't, I have to say the complete game is not totally out of question. We saw Louisville have their starter go into the 120s before getting burnt for two, uh, two runs in the top of the ninth that ultimately cost Louisville the game against Vanderbilt. One, two pitch on the way here. This one's popped up high on the infield. Jack Blom going out on the outfield grass on the left side. He's calling everybody off waiting for it to come down and makes the grab for the third out in the seventh. Tommy Henry goes one, two, three, and a big shutdown inning after Michigan scored two in the top half. We'll head to the eighth. The score, Michigan six, Vanderbilt three. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast of Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. We thank you for tuning in today, tuning in all College World Series long, tuning in all season long. We have coverage all season for Michigan baseball at the Fish. We were able to come out here for the Big Ten Tournament, which was a lot of fun, albeit just a couple less people in the stands, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, well, the Huskers really showed out for that championship game versus Ohio State. I believe the official attendance was 19,000, nearly reaching that 24,000 capacity. I don't think we're going to reach the capacity in the, today's game that we saw on day one when Michigan opened up versus Texas Tech. But yeah, it'll be close. The general admission was full almost a half hour before game time, just absolutely packed out there. And a lot of the early arrivals to this ball game today were Michigan fans in maize and blue. I remember just coming in here earlier on, just maize and blue flowing into the ballpark. Since then, you get a lot of different colors flowing in when it comes to different shirts, different allegiances in the outfield and the grandstands. But certainly a pro-Michigan crowd, I'd say. The locals here perhaps sick of Vandy winning all the time, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, and I know, uh, well, yeah, the locals probably sick of Seeing Vanderbilt among other SEC schools, Vanderbilt winning three times here recently. SEC dominating a lot, although a Pac-12 squad won it last year, defeating Arkansas in the championship. Uh, that was a great program that was looking for their first win. And uh, going into this World Series, it was kind of funny. We thought six out of these eight teams have never won a championship. We might get someone new. And then, of course, the two programs with multiple championships make it to the finals, although Michigan being one of the most interesting Cinderella stories in years in college sports, uh, not your prototypical Cinderella, a program that has won two titles, one of the biggest athletic department budgets in the nation. But uh, the big, any Big Ten team is a Cinderella in Omaha. We got a new pitcher for Vanderbilt here to start at the top of the eighth. It's Patrick Raby, the 6'3 right-hander, senior out of Knoxville, Tennessee, will come into the ball game. Raby's numbers on the year thus far, primarily a starter for Vanderbilt. He's appeared in 17 games, started 15 of them. He's 10 and one with a 3.04 ERA. 74 innings pitched for the right-hander, 78 strikeouts, 44 walks though. Batters hit 254 against him, including a few extra base hits thrown in there. Joe Donovan capable of delivering one of those extra base hits is going to lead things off here in the eighth, followed by Akeo Thomas and Jordan Wogu as Michigan cycles back up to the top of their order in this eighth inning. So you'll see that top of the order at least get one more at bat in this one. And you'd like to see the cushion if you're this top of the Michigan order. 6-3, the Wolverines lead. You don't have too much pressure on you to add a ton, but I'm sure you'd like to make a little dent. First pitch, Joe Donovan swinging and missing on a fastball. 0-1. Oh 
John Dunn. Dunn. Yeah, who's one for two right now. Uh, had that single in the second inning, but it's gone cold. I've uh, not gotten a hit for six innings now. He hits one high and deep towards left field, going back near the track, near the wall. That ball is gone! Joe Donovan goes deep here in Omaha. He tacks on his, got hit this right here, his ninth home run of the season. Second one here in the NCAA tournament. And Michigan takes a 7-3 lead on the first batter of the eighth. And Joe Donovan has number nine on the year. His second home run of the postseason. He only had two hits in Omaha before going yard. And what a story for him. Hitting a leadoff home run, answering J.J. Blede as well. The sophomore, not yet draft eligible. Uh, he did get drafted as a high school senior, but of course wanting to come to Michigan, honoring his late brother who was committed to Michigan but never got to play. Yeah, Charlie Donovan recorded a message for him beforehand as a breaking ball is in there for a strike to Taylor Thomas 0-1. Very heartfelt message how, how Joe Donovan says Charlie's always with him and how he's certainly with him here in Omaha. Big home run for the Donovan family. So K.O. Thomas checked swings and did not go around on a ball in the dirt. One-to-one -one on him. Michigan Baseball tweeting out that Charlie, always in their hearts, always with them. They know that the middle infielder, who would have been a senior this year, certainly has their back. So K.O. Thomas watches a breaking ball, missed low, it's two and one. And what a great story for Joe Donovan. He would, he's clearly one of the leaders of this team, despite being a sophomore. One of two players selected to go out to the press conference on Sunday for that championship round. And he's a, he's a really fun interview, too. Uh, he makes good facial expressions and everything while he, uh, his teammates are being asked questions. Expressive guy. 2-1 pitch to Thomas. Misses way outside. Ball three. Perhaps Raby a little bit shaken up here. Giving up a home run here to lead off the eighth. Yeah, and all that excitement. I kind of forgot that uh, there's no outs right now. Michigan is <laughs> dealing right now. 3-1 pitch to Akeo Thomas. Down and in. Ball four. So leadoff home run and then a walk to start things here in the eighth for Michigan. Looking to tack on a few more to what is now a 7-3 to three lead. And Tim Corbin might be second-guessing this substitution right now. Nasty start for Ravy. We'll see if he can settle in here, but this is not the guy you want to do that against in the Michigan lineup. Jordan Wogu had that good start with the walk, but he's due for a real hit right now. Yeah, Wogu's had a bit of a rough tournament overall. Had a few hits early on, but... Has since gone pretty cold, shown a decent eye as he walked in the first, but since two ground outs and a strikeout look and watches one that he doesn't have to even think about swinging as it bounces two feet in front of the plate. It's a 1-0 count. And that Joe Donovan homer was the first one out to left field. Uh, both the, two, the earlier two going into section 136, about 10 feet away from each other. So giving the fans on that other side of the field more <laughs> excitement. A lot of the home runs going to right field so far in this College World Series, to, to your point. Flying out that way, not too many to left as pick off throw. K.O. Thomas dies back in safely. Whole lot into that right field bullpen or over that right field bullpen. A few into right center, but I didn't count maybe three over to left field compared to, I think there's been about eight to right field. My numbers might be a little off there. Jimmy Kerr keeps adding on more before I can count them. As a 1-0 pitch misses low, ball two. Yeah, you've been to just about every game here at this College World Series. Uh... Yeah, I've never been to really more than, I think, four in a series, so this has been a blast. I've never been to a championship game before, so this has really been uh, exciting. Feeling the tension in the air as Joe Donovan cuts through it 350 feet. Uh, more than 350, I'm sure. As a 2-0 pitch is lined towards right field. That one's going to get down for a base hit. Will they send to K.O. Thomas? They will not. He'll stop at second base. He waited just a second to make sure it got down in front of Blade. But a single for Jordan Wogu here puts runners on first and second. Still nobody out in the eighth. And Michigan with a four-run lead. And now Jesse Franklin, he's gone yard as well. That one also down the right field line. I remember uh, listening back to your call from Monday. That was definitely a little bit in question whether that was going to stay fair. Not quite like the Jimmy Kerr and Joe Donovan ones, which were pretty apparent to be gone right from the get-go. You got to wonder. Uh, we saw Jimmy. We heard from Jimmy Kerr and Joe Donovan on Sunday in the press conference. They might be both selected to come out again, yeah. being the two home run hitters. Of course, uh, Joe Donovan, one of the best stories in college baseball, doing it for his brother Charlie, and Jimmy Kerr, the third generation. You know, family really is uh, quite apparent in this program. Yeah, they talk about it all the time that they are basically like playing with brothers. Joe Donovan yeah. said, uh, even if it's not literally with his brother, who unfortunately did not make it here, but certainly playing 
with his brothers on the field, having fun, spending tons of time with this team over the last month. They certainly have a lot of fun. After a mound visit, Jesse Franklin steps up, takes the ball low. It's 1-0 on him. And Patrick Raby, Ruben needs to record his first out here. There's Obviously, if he has to leave early, it's not going to do too much to his arm, but Vanderbilt does not want to have to burn three pitchers already. Coming set is Raby. And a swing and a miss there, an off-speed pitch to Jesse Franklin. It's one and one, big strike there for Raby. Franklin was looking to put that one in the seats as well and really blow this thing open. Yep, Michigan up by a grand slam now. Of course, Vanderbilt, they can score quickly. But don't think they need to try to crack this one open just yet. Get another run or two here and really give yourself some separation. Okay, you're just playing it. Turn it over to the next guy. Franklin's got a ton of room on the left side. Three infielders on the right side of second base, including the shortstop, Paul. 1-1 one, one pitch to Franklin. Another pitch that misses low. 2-1. and one. Definitely trying to work down there with that off-speed pitch is Raby. Franklin bit once, but watched it twice. And, of course, this, this game is far from over. With Vandy's offense, you're never quite out of it, especially only down four. you got to wonder how quickly Tim Corbin might yank Raby here if he walks or surrenders another hit to Jesse Franklin. Checking the runner on second is Raby, and the 2-1 pitch is a call. Strike on the outside corner, 2-2. Two and two. Michigan already up to 12 hits. I believe they recorded 14 versus Texas Tech. Got walked 12 times. That was the big difference in this one. Vandy not giving out too many freebies, but let Michigan go yard twice like Texas Tech did. Raby coming set, looking for a big first out in the eighth. 2-2 two -two pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. Broke off that breaking ball down into Franklin. Franklin looks disappointed for his second strikeout of the day. Raby finally gets an out here. And I'll bring up Jordan Brewer with a couple on and one out at the top of the eighth. Yeah, just a really nasty curveball right there. Uh, dip, dipped away from Jesse Franklin as he takes a stack second to uh, stop and look at the scoreboard to see what happened to him. Uh, Raby, that's a great one to settle him in as Jesse Franklin certainly was caught off guard there, had to take a second look at that one to understand really what fully happened. Jordan Brewer, righty against righty now. Raby, the first pitch. Breaking ball bounces in the dirt. It's 1-0. Yep, and great move there by Philip Clark, the catcher, to get behind that one. You don't want to let a K.O. Thomas or Jordan Wogu, two pretty solid base runners, advance there. Brewer, of course, has had himself a game, too. The double that really should have been a triple in the first that brought Franklin home and that single that got him on base and let him be the first of the two runs to score off that Jimmy Kerr home run. Maybe working down in the zone here with just about everything he throws, trying to get balls at the knees, get a ground ball. Jordan Brewer watches one miss low and away. It's 2-0 on him. Yeah, then you really don't want Jimmy Kerr walking up to the bait, <laughs> up to the bat with the bases loaded. Imagine a grand slam in this one. Talk Ooh. about a backbreaker. They asked Jimmy Kerr in the press conference before how big the ball looks to him right now, and he kind of laughed at it and deflected all the credit to his teammates and to his coaches. But Michigan fans certainly want no one else up to bat as a 2-0 pitch misses down again, 3-0 to Brewer. And there you have it. We're one pitch away from the bases loaded for Jimmy Kerr. And crazy to think that the Big Ten Player of the Year is the one getting protection from the guy behind him and not necessarily giving protection to the guy in front of him. And that's just this Michigan lineup. They have hitters everywhere. Joe Donovan, the lowest batting average. We saw the damage he can do, number nine on the season. 3-0 pitch to Jordan Brewer. Call a strike at the knees. It's 3-1. Michigan leads 7-3 here, trying to break it open a little bit more with runners on first and second and one out in the top of the eighth inning. Runner at second, Sakeo Thomas. Jordan Wogu is at first. Single has since had a strikeout from Franklin. Now a three misses blow ball four. And Michigan has been scoring in twos. A single would probably bring Wogu home. He's pretty speedy for a guy his size. And you can feel the roar in the dugout here. Michigan fans really clapping. They see the bases loaded and they see that big number 15 walking up to the plate. This is really a, a big time moment for the senior. Almost a major league esque feel as you get later in the game here with a packed house in Omaha. And imagine we'll. Definitely hit that 24,000 number when the attendance comes out. Jimmy Kerr looking to please a good probably two-thirds of that right here. Yes, Righty he against did. lefty. Bases loaded here. Michigan leads by four in the eighth. And you hear the let's go blue chance starting to warm up here for Jimmy Kerr. One out. First pitch fastball. 
called strike one. You don't need to hit the Grand Slam here. You don't need to try to bring two home. Even just tagging up a K.O. Thomas would do a lot. Every insurance run matters. I, I would... I'd have to say I think Vandy can probably get at least another run. The top of their lineup is due up, of course. But Michigan will be able to, to strategically pitch the rest of this game knowing they have runs to give. Raby comes set. 0-1 pitch. Breaking ball way in front of the plate. It bounces in the dirt. Jimmy Kerr swings and misses anyway. Got away from Clark. It stayed right in front of the plate, though, so Keo Thomas wasn't going to try it. And the yeah. count's 0-2. Clark had no idea where that ball was, and Keo Thomas started running full speed toward home then realized that ball was right in front of the plate. <laughs> If Clark ever found the ball, he was going to tag a KO Thomas, so wisely holding up. 0-2 count now. Jimmy Kerr with a good opportunity to at least send one deep and get Michigan an extra run. Maybe a good single can make it a six-run ball game. We'll see what he can do. Raby looking for a second strike out of the inning. 0-2 pitch. Hit high in the air towards the left side and foul ground. This one's going to be playable for Austin Martin. He walks over near the track over that way and now moves back onto the grass and records the foul pop out. Huge out number two for Raby here in the eighth. So with two gone, base is loaded. Blake Nelson will step up to the plate for the Wolverines. Another senior in this Michigan lineup looking for a big senior moment perhaps. Michigan's ahead 4-3, or I'm sorry, 7-3, a four-run lead for him. But you can never have enough against this Michigan, or rather it's this Vanderbilt lineup. Yeah, Pippi Huge, Blake Nelson, already two singles on the day, one of them being an RBI. Nelson stays single, strikeout, strikeout, single. Also has an RBI and a stolen base on the day. Righty, righty. He hopped on the first pitch and both his singles. We'll see if he does so here. First pitch. Misses low in the dirt, ball one. He puts out his hand to tell K.O. Thomas to stay over there at third base. Count is 1-0. and And Michigan, they have been scoring in twos, so... Going by that, <laughs> maybe a pass ball, a wild pitch that scores a K.O. Thomas before this inning ends. Maybe an infield hit or something like that. Kind of hard to do an infield single with uh, the bases loaded. A lot of tags, a lot of force outs, but it's been done before. Not impossible. You can see a little chopper that someone just can't feel. Or a ball in the hole maybe that the shortstop can't make a strong enough throw to first. Either way, 1-0 count here on Nelson. Fastball called strike one you would imagine that Michigan's going to be sending their runners a lot of speed on the bases right now. K.O. Thomas, Jordan Brewer, and Jordan Wogu. Yeah, if ball hits the outfield, I'm sure Wogu's being sent. If a ball hits the gap, Jordan Brewer will be booking it from first. He won the Big Ten Player of the Year, Jordan Brewer did, because of his offense, but also because of his speed and his defense, his arm out there in right field. He's certainly got tons of speed and can score from first if Nelson finds a gap. But on 1-1, Nelson watches a breaking ball break off into the strike zone. And it's one and two. Really sharp breaking ball from Raby. Drops off the table. We saw that second pitch, Jimmy Kerr, how Kerr thought it was right down the pipe, and it dropped off and bounced in front of the plate. Yeah, both both uh, Brewer and Wogu had D1 offers for football. Maybe we'll make that uh, another trivia question. Uh, I, I, for well, which you can't do it up. now. It's a bit late in the game, that's <laughs> for sure. Well, it can't. Yeah, it tilted our hand, but... One-two pitch, Nelson. He hits this one in the air down the right field line. This one is hooking, perhaps foul. Is there a play? There is a play for the right fielder, Blade. In foul ground, makes the grab for out number three here in the eighth inning. But Joe Dynamo with a solo home run to lead things off, even though Michigan stranded, the base is loaded. Extends the lead to four. Michigan leads Vanderbilt 7-3, headed to the bottom of the eighth inning. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. And should Michigan blow this lead, the story of the game will be the runners left on base. They have 10 left on base as opposed to Vandy's three in this whole NCAA tournament run. I don't think they've had a single game that they won where they didn't hit better with runners in scoring position. Right now they're only at 200, three for 15, while Vandy is one for three with runners in scoring position. Not out of the woods yet. Four run lead, seven to three here as we enter the bottom of the eighth. The flip side there is... Of course, Michigan has 15 at-bats with runners in scoring position compared to Vandy's three. And well, should I ask it now, if I've already tilted the hand, that there's a trivia question for uh, Jordan Wogu? I mean, you might as well. We're having a good time here up 7-3 for the Michigan Wolverines in so the, the eighth inning. The last team from the Midwest will say, uh, give an official definition that you can say is concrete, the last team to make the College World Series final from a state with a Big Ten school in that state is also one of the two schools that Jordan Wogu was being recruited by to play Division I football. 
We'll see if anyone can get that here in the next inning. I believe I think we went over this before, so I won't give away any yeah. answers here. Official attendance day, 24,707 in the ballpark. I don't even think that counts the amount of press that has flown in here for this big championship series. Yep. Certainly coverage amplifying. Officially 400 less than the opening game for Michigan where they started this College World Series against Texas Tech. But with press, I mean, I see like 20 people at least in each camera well. I will repeat that trivia question one more time if anyone wants to take a stab. I think this one's a bit easier. You can maybe apply some common sense to it that uh, what is the one school from a Big Ten state to reach the College World Series since Ohio State lasted in 1966 that is also one of the two schools that offered Jordan Wogu a D1 football scholarship. Tommy Henry is going to start the eighth against the top of the Vanderbilt lineup and Austin Martin fires a first pitch change up off the plate away, 1-0. And after Martin comes the big rematch with J.J. Blede, the last man to score a run off Tommy Henry. Big match up here as well with Martin. Can't look past him. 1-0 pitch to him. Misses down and away, ball two. Oh, Certainly and yeah, don't you can, put runners on. You can never look past him, but how big would it be to at least get one out and no one on for J.J. Blede? I mean, Austin Martin, 405 batting average, 497 on base percentage. He swung quickly in his at bats. He hasn't really gotten a shot to talk about him too much. He's one for three, single and two ground outs. 2-0 pitch to him this time. Misses down and in ball three. Walking Austin Martin isn't the worst thing you can do, but you, at this point you want to get into a position where Vandy never has the tying run up to the plate. As we speculated, it's Jeff Criswell warming in the bullpen with a four-run lead for the Wolverines. And I think Backich will be quick to pull Tommy Henry if need be. Certainly want to win game one and then figure it out from there is Backage's strategy. Henry winds up 3-0 pitch. Fastball called. No. High. Ball four. And you do have Kumar Rocker due up for Tuesday. It will almost certainly be Chriswell versus Kumar Rocker in Tuesday's matchup. Of course, Rocker, the freshman, set the college baseball world ablaze. Could have gone pro very easily as a high school senior. Instead, elects to play, a play at Vanderbilt where his father played football, Kumar Rocker, had that phenomenal 19 strikeout no hitter versus Duke. So big matchup here, Henry versus Blade. Henry got him the first two times with a ground out and a foul pop out on a solo home run in the sixth for Blade. Even the score a bit, first pitch fastball, rather first pitch breaking ball on the outside corner. It's 0-1. Martin, plenty of speed over there, can't take him for granted. 18 for 23 this year for the Commodores on stolen base attempts. Yep, all around really a perfect prospect. That's why he might go number one next year. Oh, one pitch breaks off that breaking ball again. Check swing did not go around, says Greg Charles at third base. The count is one on one. I've received word that Jimmy Kerr is tre trending nationally on Twitter right now. Also a reminder that if you're listening, you can follow us at twitter.com backslash WCBN sports to receive reminders about all of our content, broadcasts or blogs or podcasts. At Twitter handle at WCBN Sports. First pitch to center, third pitch to Blade here is fouled off down the left field line into the second deck. And the count's now one and two on the big left hander. And huge that Michigan added those runs in the last couple innings from Kerr and Donovan because a one run ball game right now would be a very, very touchy situation with Blade at the plate and Martin on first base. Instead, it's a four run ball game now. Michigan up 7-3, bottom of a 1-2 count on Blade. We'll see what Henry can do here with the infield shifted to the right. 1-2. High and away fastball. That's 2-2. Two two. Pitch number 100 coming up quickly for Tommy Henry. He went to exactly the 1-0 against Florida State in his nine-inning complete game. Chriswell not quite warming up at full speed over there. He is on the mound and throwing, but a little bit of a half-hearted follow-through. Now he starts to ramp it up a little bit. Henry's ready for a 2-2 pitch to Blade. Checks the runner a couple times, and now the offering. Swing and a miss, strike three. Huge strikeout there for Tommy Henry to get the number four overall pick. There's one out and one on in the eighth for Ethan Paul. And not really doing it with strikeouts like he did in his last outing versus Florida State, but all in all, having a remarkable game, holding Vanderbilt to three runs 
He hasn't done it yet for a complete game, but if you can hold him to three through eight, you give your team a chance to win. And the Michigan bats have really woken up after two okay to maybe disappointing days in the first two games, scoring 15 th through nine, and right now seven through eight in their last two appearances. First pitch to Ethan Paul is a foul ball behind the plate. The count is 0-1. Donovan jumping out of his stance there, perhaps thinking if that ball was right in front of the plate, you'd be able to fire it on to second and start a double play. Tommy Henry probably fully aware any pitch now could be his last in the Michigan uniform. He fully intends to join the Colorado Rockies at the end of this season. Arizona Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks. It was Kaufman drafted by the Rockies. We'll see Kaufman at some point in this series, I'm sure. Henry comes set, checking Martin again, and a third time. Now the 0-1. Swing and a miss at a high fastball. It's 0-2. Pitch, pitch number 100. That's the magic number for him. He's dealing again. I want, how much do you think that's a um, confidence boost to strike out the guy who just hit a homer off you? Certainly doesn't feel bad, I'll tell you that much. Ethan Paul on the day against Henry. Strikeout, a grounded in a double play in the third, another ground out in the sixth. He's down 0-2 now. Lefty to lefty again. The infield shifted towards the right, not quite as extreme as they were with Blade. Blondridge still playing on his shortstop side of second base, but no two pitch. Hit in the air down the left field line. That one's slicing. That'll get foul and bounce up off the stands. So the count will remain 0-2 on Paul. Henry had 10 strikeouts in his outing versus Florida State. Got one every 10 pitches. That's a pretty efficient rate right there. Uh, right now only at 7, but is a pitch away from number 8 maybe. I'm sure he'd love a double play ball too, though. Henry steps on the mound. When he's getting a sign out of the stretch, he's pretty much straight up with one foot pointed towards home and one pointed towards first base, and then comes set with both feet pointed towards first. And now the 0-2 pitch, ground ball towards the right side, past the diving of Thomas into right field. They're going to send Martin. Brewer comes up throwing towards third base. The throw is online. The three, he is out at third base. What a play by Brewer. That's the first time that K.O. Thomas has really let anything by him all series long, and Jordan Brewer backs him up. He's got his back. He may be 100 feet behind his back, but what a throw. What a corral by Blake Nelson. I don't think they'll take a look at this unless a really impressive swim move was made by Austin Martin, but maybe the best baseball player here in Omaha remaining gets thrown out by the Big Ten Player of the Year. Jordan Brewer looking towards the right field stands, waving his arms up, getting the Michigan fans on their feet as we see a replay. Martin was out easily. Tried to swim around the bag, came off the bag anyway. Blake Nelson with a fist pump pointing out towards Brewer. Akeo Thomas, Jack Blomberg pointed out towards Brewer. Tommy Henry was just stuck pointing towards Brewer. And they have to give him a big thanks there. So what would have been a single in first and third is erased by the arm of Jordan Brewer. Cannon out in right field. There's two outs, runner on first for Philip Clark. And please tell me again, there's not enough talent in the Midwest for a team to win the national championship. The Big Ten right there showing off they have all the talent they need. First pitch to Clark, misses for a ball. It's 1-0 on him. Jordan Brewer preserves the 7-3 lead here with two out in the bottom of the eighth and prevents another runner in scoring position for Vandy. Looks like they might have to try to score four runs at least in the bottom of the ninth. 1-0 pitch, breaking ball, swung on and missed from Clark. It's 1-1. One and one. Clark is 1-3 for three on the day. Single and a ground out and a fly out in this one. And there have been three home runs in this game, but that may very well be the play of the game right there from Jordan Brewer. Certainly stopped the momentum from shifting. It would have been the first time Vanderbilt's had a couple runners on in a few innings. Have to go all the way back to the second inning when they had two runners on at one time. This one's a ground ball towards first. Jimmy Kerr's going to field it foul, though. So the count's one and two on Henry as he takes off his cap and collects the ball from Jimmy Kerr. Michigan fans starting to clap here before this one-two pitch. Yep, we heard those let's go blue chants right after all the excitement died down from the Jordan Brewer throw to third. Keeping that momentum in the stadium. We now hear the fans applauding, not really letting Vanderbilt forget. They are down 4 nothing to a last four team in. A team from that conference that can't win national championships, can't even make it to Omaha is what we were told. 1-2 pitch. Called! Strike three! Henry throws him on the fastball. Gives big ups to Blake Nelson for the tag. Nelson runs over to Jordan Brewer here. Pumped up as Jordan Brewer's coming to the dugout, being applauded. Huge strikeout from Tommy Henry. That's the eighth of the day for him. We'll head to the ninth inning. Michigan leads 7-3 in game one of the National Championship Series here in Omaha. And Jordan Brewer kind of stole the moment from Tommy Henry. You, you always got to feel great leaving the mound for the dugout after a strikeout. But Jordan Brewer had, I think, twice as many teammates come and congratulate him. I think it was 8-4. to four for, No one's really <laughs> keeping track. But... Uh, that, that's what I, that was what I counted, at least. 
Jordan Brewer, that that might have been the play that, of this that game. That didn't bounce, did it? I, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, it's all, it's all a blur at this point from up here. I, that was a strike from right field. Anyway, we just want to thank you again for listening into the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports. I'm Austin Falco. Daniel Thompson is sitting right here next to me for what has been a wild ride for the Michigan Wolverines and certainly a wild ride here tonight. The Wolverines feeling great about themselves going into the ninth with a four-run lead, a chance to take command in this championship series. Of course, winning game one doesn't necessarily mean you have it wrapped up. We saw that just last year between Arkansas and Oregon State. Arkansas winning game one, almost winning game two, but then ultimately dropping the last two. It does help your team a ton, though, going up 1-0 in terms of pitching strategy, in terms of confidence. Uh, you can play even a little bit looser when you know you have a little bit of a cushion to play with. And especially when you know, have, you know you have outfielders like Jordan Brewer who can just, I mean, that was a rocket. I mean, he doesn't normally do that. No one does, but. Uh, we've seen that arm all year long from Jordan Brewer. I was quite surprised that Vanderbilt tried to test it there. They are an aggressive base running team, though, just like Michigan is. So uh, opting for the send there, Austin Martin went for it and paid the price. Jordan Brewer has every once in a while uncorked one that was just a little bit wild, but when he's on the mark, it is a bullet from that right field side. As the sun is setting here in Omaha, the bright lights coming on, the Bob Carey pedestrian bridge over to Iowa. The BKB. BKB, I like that. Uh, gets lit up here as the sun is just over the west end of Omaha. We can kind of see it to our backs right now. They have turned on the uh, little hologram, I don't know what you call that exactly, but the home run animation on the First National Bank Tower. First pitch to Christian Bullock to lead off top of the ninth here, misses ball one. Michigan leads 7-3 here in the top of the ninth inning. Bullock has slipped back into three consecutive strikeouts. He fouls one behind the plate. Now that one's going to get up. Will it hit the roof? It will not. It'll go into the club seats, and it's 1-1 one one on Bullock now. As you mentioned, foul pop out back in the first, but three strikeouts since then. Got the hat trick on the day, trying to avoid another one. As the wind-up, 1-1 one, one pitch to him from Raby. Is a called strike on the outside part of the plate with the breaking ball. It's 1-2. and two. And Bullock ended his day against Florida State with three strikeouts. Not a day that Michigan needed really any offense at all. That one just Franklin homer on the second pitch of the game was enough. This one's a line drive into right center field for a base hit. Will Bullock try for two? He is booking it around first. He's going to try for two. He is going to get in there with a slide. Didn't need to slide, but did it anyway. And it's a leadoff double in the ninth. Michigan can tack on even more insurance, possibly. And that is something that maybe... Three players here in this game could possibly do that. Jordan Brewer, one of them. Bandy's got some speed too, but turn that double, turn that what, a single for 99% of batters into a double. That's what he offers. It Doesn't strikes out a lot, but it might honestly be the two guys closest to Charlie on the field right now with uh, Christian Bullock and Harrison Ray out there, the second baseman for Vanderbilt. Those might be the only two guys that I think can get to second on that one as easily as Bullock just did. Jack Blomgren will step up here. Michigan again leading by four. Runner in scoring position, no outs here in the top of the ninth. Blomgren on the day is one for, or rather two for three, including a walk. He squares on the bunt, takes the first pitch, called strike at the knees. Lead off hitter on, that's always a recipe for success and definitely has been one of Michigan's keys all the way through this postseason. You got a speedy guy with none out. But Michigan has had a ton of two out RBIs in this postseason thus far, and they have their fair share today as well but they haven't needed the two RBIs today, which has been huge for them. It really hasn't been an issue of, oh, so close to getting out of an inning for Vanderbilt. As Blomgren lays on the bunt towards the left side. Austin Martin's got the bare hand, and he can't do it. Blomgren's going to get his third <laughs> infield hit to Austin Martin. He has been a menace for Martin today, apparently. Talk about deja vu. I, that's three times now. Nearly the same thing happens to Austin Martin. And, you know, that's got to be in his head now. I, He's got to be frustrated because it's Blomgren every time now. Yeah. The so, infi infielder may be getting inside his fellow infielder's head right there. I'm sure not purposely for Jack Blomgren. I mean, that one was meant to be a <laughs> sacrifice that he was just booking it down the line anyway. Instead, he gets himself a base hit here on the bunt single. It's first and third, nobody out for Joe Donovan, who is coming off, going deep as the first batter Raby faced. Yep, three out-of-state guys right now on the bases for Michigan. Eric Backage and Tim Corbin, of course, working together at Vanderbilt back when Backage was just an assistant, talking about their strategies, recruiting all across the country. We'll see what the Chicago native can do here. The first pitch is fouled back behind the plate. That's going to get over the screen and out of play. The count is 0.
Chicago guys, well, maybe not quite a Chicago or in your parlance as Joe Donovan uh, from the western suburbs. Uh, teammate Christian Bullock from Chicago, Chicago City proper going to Morgan Park High. Chicago, of course, being one of the best hotbed recruits, uh, hotbeds of recruiting in the Midwest. Yeah, lots of players up there, lots of people up there. You can definitely find a few gems, and Michigan has a few on their roster, including a couple guys on the field right now. As the 0-1 pitch is swung on and missed from Donovan, blew the fastball by him, and it's 0-2. Eric Backage definitely discussed how he goes out, tries to find players maybe who didn't get an opportunity to play travel ball. Has camps, tries to find players from cities like Chicago where he found both Christian Bullock and Akeo Thomas. Yeah, the same White Sox program that they used to help promote baseball in inner cities brought both to Ann Arbor. And Joe Donovan, 0-2 pitch to him, swinging a miss out of breaking ball in the dirt. Starts off to run, but he can't with a runner occupying first base and less than two outs. So a strikeout there from Donovan. Still a satisfying day for him with a couple hits, a couple runs scored, and a home run. That'll bring up a man we were just talking about, Akeo Thomas, with two runners on and one out in the ninth. Still leading by four are the Wolverines. And we'll see if Michigan can do anything with two out. That's been the one bugaboo in this game. They could have really blown it open and maybe really gone deep into Vanderbilt's pitching staff. They had a couple of two out hits or maybe got some sack flies with one out. Akeo Thomas is not really the guy who you think of when you want a one out sack fly, but Christian Bullock is speedy, to say the least. Akeo Thomas on the day has been on base three times. He's officially one for one on the day. That's the first pitch to him. It's a fastball up high, ball one. Back in the second inning, he had a RBI double, which he poked a ball down the left field line that just dropped fair. Since then, it's sacrifice bunt and two walks. Yeah, still officially one for one on his fifth trip to the, to, to the uh, batter's box. Having a really nice game. Had a couple of great defensive gems. And that's a great point about the fifth time that Akeo Thomas at the plate. Vanderbilt, when they come up, would just be seeing the fourth time at the plate for the middle, bottom, middle to bottom of their order. Akeo Thomas takes the 1-0 pitch for a call. Strike one and one. Absolutely huge for Michigan last inning to avoid giving up any runs to the top of that lineup. They might not have to see them again. And for Vanderbilt in the bottom half of the ninth, it will be the five, six, and seven hitters due up in lineup. Michigan would certainly like to tack on more to their 7-3 lead just to be safe. 1-1 one, one pitch to Akeo Thomas, swung on and missed, blew a fastball by him there, and it's 1-2. Tried to get a piece of that one, send it as deep as he can. Not a home run hitter, two on the year. One in the state of Nebraska, though, back in... Hawks Field in uh, Lincoln against the Huskers in the last game of the regular season. He can just drive one to the warning track, though, or even, I mean, Christian Bullock can score if you hit that to the middle of the outfield. Might be able to score if you get an infielder running back on a pop-up. That's how quick Christian Bullock is. One-two pitch to Thomas. Swinging and a miss, strike three of the high fastball. You see that breaking ball from Raby that he threatened earlier and got a few outs with really come into play now as guys are swinging way late on a fastball that's not necessarily blowing everybody away. It's not coming in mid-90s. Probably coming in low 90s, maybe high 80s, but guys are way behind it because of that big looping breaking ball. And that'll cycle back up to the top of the order for Jordan Wogu. Still a couple runners on at the corners. Two outs in the top of the ninth inning. Yep, this is Michigan's maybe last chance to try to drive in a run with the last couple outs of their inning. Righty to righty here. Raby to Wogu, first pitch misses high, ball one. Wogu not having a great day, just one for four, but he's gotten in on this offensive action. Yeah, in order, his plate appearances, walk, ground out, ground out, strike out on a single. The single did come against Raby last inning in the eighth. 1-0 pitch this time is an off-speed pitch that misses low and away, it's 2-0. And, and that's number 40 for Raby, so you'd have to think probably both Vanderbilt relievers that we've seen today aren't going to be available and, and not available for long at the least on Tuesday. And Vandy didn't go to their top bullpen arms. Obviously, Raby a starter here, as well as King has also started some games for a more of a longer guy. Didn't go to the, the really shut down guy. How the pen is. Wogu hits one deep towards right center field. This one's going back near the track, near the wall. That ball is caught right before the track by Blade in right field. That ball looked like it had some carry on it, but kind of died out there near the warning track. So a long, hard out number three. Sends Michigan down without any runs in the ninth. Good and job there to work out of it by Raby. We'll head to the bottom of the ninth. Michigan leads 7-3 over Vanderbilt. You're listening to the official student radio broadcast for Michigan baseball here on WCBN Sports.
and Blomgren probably scores there if he if that ball takes a hop. But nonetheless, Jordan Wogu not able to convert it. Our uh, trivia second trivia question of the day. It was Eastern Michigan that uh, one of two schools that offered Jordan Wogu. He was committed uh, recruited by both, of course. Still in Ypsilanti County is Eastern Michigan, much like the University of Michigan. Wogu, of course, Washtenaw decided. Washtenaw County. Washtenaw County. What did I say? <laughs> Ypsilanti, Ypsilanti County. Ypsilanti, sorry. It's the city of Ypsilanti in Washtenaw County. Two D1 programs in the same county, but uh, he chooses to play baseball for the Wolverines instead. The sport that he said he wanted to play in college. And, of course, for the school that both his parents worked at in the U.M. medical system, his father a research professor and his mother a doctor as well in the U.M. medical hospital system, choosing to go to Michigan over football offers to play defensive end for both Eastern Michigan and Kent State. It was in 1976, 10 years after Ohio State made it, that, w that Eastern Michigan lost in the College World Series championship series. Well, I can tell you something that happened relatively recently, and that was Tommy Henry went all the way in a ball game just one week ago against Florida State, had a three-hit shutout. He's back on the mound here for the bottom of the ninth, trying to put together a performance which he gives up three runs, just two earned against Vanderbilt. He's got himself a four-run lead here going into the bottom of the ninth. Michigan leads 7-3. Jeff Criswell appears to be ready in the bullpen if he is needed, but Henry's at least going to get the chance to finish this ball game off. We saw in the UCLA uh, re Super Regional, Carl Coffin nearly got his first complete game of the season, went eight and two thirds, but put runners on second and third with a one run lead for Criswell to clean up. We'll see if Henry can go the distance. Now, if he puts a few on, he, it might end up getting to the situation where Austin Martin or someone could represent the tying run when they come up to the bat. So he's gonna wanna make this stress free. 12 runners left on base for the Wolverines. That could come back to haunt them. First pitch to DeMarco is a called strike on the off-speed pitch. It's 0-1. DeMarco, Scott, and Ray are due up in this inning. They are combined 1 for 8 with a hit-by-pitch and a reached-on error against Tommy Henry in this ballgame. And Henry still has Duvall and Infante as padding before the top of that Vanderbilt lineup. Working relatively quickly. 0-1 pitch. This one's hit on a line towards deep left center field. Jesse Franklin and Christian Bullock giving chase. That one's going to bounce right off the base of the wall. Franklin Fields throws all the way back towards second. It will not be in time to get DeMarco. He'll coast in a second with a leadoff double here in the ninth. And Michigan maybe won't make, won't let this one be easy either. If I'm Eric Backage, I think now is time to go to Chriswell. But we'll see. It looks like Henry is staying on the mound for now. It's down there, this bottom of this Vanderbilt lineup where you get a lot of righty-lefty switches, so you can't really necessarily work the matchups and say, oh, Chris Well will face more righties than lefties necessarily. That was a lefty to start off with Pat DeMarco, or sorry, righty to start off with Pat DeMarco, now lefty Stephen Scott coming up. And part of what's so bizarre about this game, not only is Michigan just beating Vanderbilt by four, but they've really outplayed them by probably more than that, winning in hits 14-7. to seven. Michigan and Vanderbilt both won air apiece. Michigan could be up by a lot more, and that really could come back to bite. You hear the Vandy Whistler starting to get a little prominent as a first pitch is fouled up behind the plate, and I'll get out of play over the screen. 0-1 on Stephen Scott. Yep, to the annoyance of many local fans. A lot of Nebraskans know him from all the Vanderbilt's trips to Omaha and are a bit annoyed with it, but he was told to cut it out by the staff here in Omaha. Uh, and I think I thought he was very respectful with the way he limited it in the Louisville game. No problem at all with the way he runs like that. And I think now is a fine time for him to get involved too. Ninth inning of a game when your team trails by four. Trying to get them back in it. 0-1 pitch here to Steven Scott after Henry is going to step off and keep DeMarco close at second. Scott so far 0-3 for 3 against Henry today. Two strikeouts and a fly out to center. 1-10 coming for Tommy Henry, but it's the fourth time for all these batters to see him. I think it might be time to get Chriswell in and get an unfamiliar arm. A one pitch, off speed. This is bounced towards the right side. Sliding stop by Jimmy Kerr. He feeds Henry, covering the bag, and Henry is run into over there by Scott, and Scott took the worst of it. I think he got an elbow to the face. Scott perhaps a little bit shaken up. First base umpire Perry Costello getting right between Scott and Henry as Henry walks back to the mound and Scott walks back to the dugout. Henry, look, anything. Henry looking almost like a quarterback uh, forced to block right there with a really clumsy kind of throwing his arm into Scott. Not in any way deliberately trying to rattle up Scott, but just trying to protect himself when Scott came running for him at first base. It's, you know, that's when you play sports, situations like that will happen, and fortunately no one looks badly shaken up. The runner does advance to third, but I don't think Michigan minds that much at all. 
Seven to three ball game. Michigan is two outs away from going up one nothing and being a game away from being national champions. I think Tommy Henry after that is going to be done at 110 pitches even air. Backage making the slow walk out to the mound. You're about to get a big old hand here for Tommy Henry coming off the mound. He motions down to get Chriswell out of the pen. And we'll wait for Chriswell to come in, take the ball from Tommy Henry. Michigan fans, all fans already standing on their feet for Tommy Henry who was absolutely magnificent against Florida State. And here in his final start as a Wolverine, probably his final pitch thrown as a Wolverine, comes out with a 7-3 lead in game one of the College World Series Finals. Let's listen in to the Michigan fans. Much, much deserved round of applause and standing ovation for Tommy Henry. His line isn't officially closed. He is responsible for the runner at third, but he went eight and a third inning, seven hits. Right now sitting at three runs, two of them earned. One walk, eight strikeouts on the day for the left-hander out of Portage, Michigan, who has thrown his final pitch for the Wolverines in all likelihood. He'll go on to play for the Diamondbacks starting next season in their system. We wish him all the best here at WCBN Sports. and. Well, sure, a pleasure to watch him over these few years. I'm sure all Michigan fans will agree it was certainly a pleasure to watch him this season on this, what has become a magical run. And his fellow uh, cityman, I guess, uh, Jeff Criswell comes in just a year younger than Henry. Henry went to Portage Northern, and Portage Central is where Jeff Criswell hails from. A real strikeout pitcher. He has been magical in Omaha, not allowing a single run in his time. At, uh, I believe it's five innings pitched. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds about right. Five innings pitched. We leave Kaufman for a couple innings back in the very first game that Michigan played here in this College World Series. And Henry went the distance in game two, and Chris Well pitched three in relief of Kaufman in their third game in which they finished off Texas Tech. And Kaufman looked downright nasty, especially in that third one. Facing the minimum, striking out six. And really, he got a single that creeped through the right side and then got double play ball to end it in terms of not having perfect innings exactly. He'll face Harrison Ray to start things off here in the ninth. And barring a double playing, which the runner on third, DeMarco, was doubled up, Ty Duval will also see his turn at the plate against Chris Well. And I think Michigan will be eager to let uh, to trade an out for a run here. Uh, that's not really a luxury band he has, and that's part of the the advantage of being a pitching with when you're four up in the bottom of the ninth. You know exactly how much you can afford to give, and Michigan would not mind at all. I mean, the bunt is out of the question. If Ray beams one into the outfield, they'll be fine with that as long as they can come up with the out. Criswell, who, yeah, was a bad man in his performance <laughs> versus Texas Tech. Uh, it's a great way to describe it. Yeah, faced with the minimum, nine batters did give up the one hit. Nearly perfect as Michigan hopes to not go to the true bullpen at all in the first in their first five games, four games rather, at the College World Series. First pitch from Chriswell to Harrison Ray is a fastball called strike, and you can see the uptick in velocity from Chriswell. Again, it says 91 on the radar here, but we know Chriswell likes to get up near 94, touch 95 at times. There was one game, I believe it was the Monday game against Florida State, where the radar seemed to be just about accurate, but all the games since then seem to be a little couple ticks low. As Chris Hill readies for an 0-1 pitch to Ray, who is 1 for 3 on the day. He swings and hits one towards center field. Jesse Franklin's going back, but he's going to have plenty of room. Makes the grab. Tagging up is DeMarco. He'll score. So Henry officially finishes with four runs, three earned on the day. And Vandy cuts in that lead just a little bit. It's 7-4 Michigan with two outs in the ninth. Yep, that is going to be the least celebrated run maybe of Vandy's whole season. Uh... Right now, with the way they have it set up, Austin Martin couldn't represent the tying run. He's gone yard twice here in Omaha. But Jeff Criswell just has to retire one of the next two before, and then he won't have to deal at all with the man who will likely be a first-round pick in next year's 2020 MLB draft. Ty Duvall steps in righty against lefty. Criswell winds and fires a first-pitch fastball high and away, ball one. Joe Donovan tells him to calm down a little bit out there. Yep, that one... Uh, 
metered here at 92, probably a little bit quicker. Probably around 95, 96, I guess. Griffin really dialing up, working out of the windup now as opposed to the stretch. The 1 0 pitch. Looked like he went off speed there with that nasty slider that broke in off the outside part of the plate. It's 1 and 1. Duval does have five homers on the year, but you're never going to get a true break in the Vandy order. This is where you put them away now. Do not let those home run hitters at the top get up to the plate. Chris Rell winds, 1-1 one, one pitch. Swing and a miss, strike two. Michigan one strike away from taking a 1-0 lead here in this best of three College World Series finals. Michigan fans rising to their feet here in Omaha. Chris Rell is on the mound ready for the pitch. Duvall steps in, the big right-hander gets his sign from his fellow sophomore, takes a breath on the mound, the windup, the one-two. Popped foul, left side out of play. Good for Duvall, kind of silence this crowd just a little bit. Don't surrender to the momentum just yet. Michigan though, one pitch away from something, but I think if I told you a month ago, you would have said I was crazy. Michigan shifted right on the infield, outfield straight up. 1-2 count here. Chriswell again takes a breath. Winds with his hands over his head, the pitch. Misses low and way with the breaking ball. It's 2-2. Two and two. Duvall will. He knows he's going to get another chance in this College World Series, but it's up to him to extend this game. Chriswell has a three-run cushion to pitch behind. 2-2 two, two count on the batter, Ty Duvall. Two outs here, bottom of the ninth. Michigan leads 7-4. Sophomore Chriswell looking to pick up another save. The 2-2 pitch misses down and in ball three. Full count walking would not be tragic, but you don't want to give Infante a chance to get on base and set up Martin. Martin could represent the tying run. And to correct myself, I don't think it's technically a save, but looking to finish off his fourth ball game in the four times that he's come in in relief is no, Chriswell. Yeah, two outs with a four-run lead I don't think is going to get it for you. But, but a 3-2 count now on Duval. Chriswell takes a big old breath. Now winds up the payoff pitch. Ground ball up the middle. Jack Lomgren fields. He takes his time, throws to first in time for out number three. Michigan takes game one by a score of seven to four. They lead this series 1-0 over the Vanderbilt Commodores in the College World Series finale. Jeff Criswell, reliever extraordinaire. Not often are that's the well won the formatting of this college world series. If you win games, you get long breaks. And that has allowed Michigan to not even use Ref Criswell yet as an opener. Get the start Tuesday in all likelihood. Kaufman probably not ready to go, and he is going to have a fresh arm. I did not catch how many pitches Criswell ended this game with, but it wasn't too many. Criswell on the that outing through just nine pitches to finish off the two batters and finishes off Tommy Henry's good work. Tommy Henry in the offense behind Jimmy Kerr and Joe Donovan's long balls give Michigan enough to come out of here with a W in game one. And they are now just one win away from a national championship. Like you said, Daniel, something perhaps crazy a month ago. But now these Wolverines, they believe. That's their slogan. We believe. And they've got a whole lot of fans here in Omaha and at home believing on with them. Final line score for the day, Michigan seven runs on 14 hits, one error. Vanderbilt four runs on seven hits and an error of their own. Tommy Henry, the pitcher for the Wolverine, gets the win, moves to 12 and five. Drake Fellows, the starter, takes the loss and moves to 13 and two on the season. And yeah, just one more win away from a national championship for these Michigan Wolverines, Daniel. Did anyone tell Michigan this isn't supposed to happen? I they, don't think they did. You're not supposed to be able to hit 14 hits on Vandy. I mean. Realistically, Vanderbilt was lucky to get away with only seven runs allowed in this game. This could have been a lot uglier for them. Containing Vandy to just four runs, that is something special. That's only their 11th loss on the whole season. And I mean, there, there's no way I'm going to be able to explain just how marvelous this run has been. I've been so grateful to see these, uh, this team in Omaha. You've seen even a bit more of them in Omaha and uh, watching them on their West Coast journey, riding that very long road to Omaha. They now have a short road to the national championship. Michigan will go for that national championship tomorrow night at six o'clock central, seven o'clock Eastern time, right here, same place you heard us tonight. 
youtube.com backslash WCBN Sports. Follow us on Twitter at WCBN Sports for our game announcement. We'll tweet out the link or subscribe to us. You can click a little notification bell. We'll let you know when we are going to broadcast tomorrow night's game. Again, Michigan will go for the national championship after a 7-4 win tonight. For Daniel Thompson, I'm Austin Falco. For all of us here at WCBN Sports, we're signing off from Omaha for the night with a good night and a go blue.